in the last IMSA race at Laguna Seca Raceway, John Paul Jr.'s Buick Hawk became the 13th car destroyed in a devastating 86 season. The race before that, Riverside, California, this incredible melee wiped out three cars. Miraculously, drivers Doc Bundy, Lynn St. James, and Chip Robinson walked away. Today, the track is tougher than Laguna or Riverside. 1,000 horsepower monsters are about to tackle the toughest track on the circuit, Charlotte Motor Speedway. Stand by for action in the Charlotte Grand Prix. Spain. Welcome to Charlotte Motor Speedway and live TBS Sports coverage of a major sporting event in America. The name of the game, endurance sports car racing. Impressive statistics. Quarter million dollar cars that run 200 miles an hour racing here for a weekend prize of some $300,000. The distance here, 138 laps. That's 500 kilometers. Call it 310 miles. And the track, certainly the toughest on the circuit. It's 2.25 miles, 12 turns, and one of them has been the source of great controversy here this week. We're going to show you the reason why just a little bit later on. It is uh, the fastest car in the field that will be driven by this gentleman. Come on over here, Derek Bell, world champion in this form of racing over in Europe. Despite being the fastest car in the field, they're not on the pole. Al Holbert had a crash in practice, came back to set a track record, but you'll start third today. The Porsche dominance has been cracked in this form of racing, and this is a big big day for you. Well, it's the biggest day of the year we've had so far. You know, we've got to go out and prove the Porsche can still do it, and Al and I, we know we're capable of doing it. We've had a lot of bad luck, so today we're going to go out there and we're going to do our damnedest to win. Lingering damage or uh, effects from the crash earlier this week? Nothing at all. No, the car's better than ever. So you're going to go straight to the front? You bet. <laughs> Well, at the front, he'll find Klaus Ludwig in the Ford Probe. They be here a year ago, and then last week won its first race. Today, they start on the pole. Let's hear from the pole sitter now, and joining him is the Dean of American Motorsports Broadcasters, 50 years of experience in the business, from National Speed Sport News, Chris Economaki. Okay, thank you, Dave. I'm with Klaus Ludwig and his co-driver, Tom Gloy. Tom, you're going to watch the first part, right? Yep, I'm going to watch. Give it to Klaus. He's done a good job all weekend. That's why we've got the Ford on pole. Okay, now, Klaus, I see you're already with a lot of plumbing here. The track is admittedly a difficult racetrack. What about this heat today? Uh, it will be very, uh, extremely hot in the cars. We reckon it's be over 100 degrees, and so we use this cool suit, and this helps a lot. The race that was held just before this left the track rather slippery. Will you go pretty easy at the beginning? Uh, I think we're going to have some yellows in the beginning, and so I don't know. It depends on, on how fast the other goes. I think, I think we're going to have a good pack together in the first first hour six cars or so even though you're the pole position man there are those behind you who are faster is this a matter of concern for you Chris there's nobody faster you know they changed between uh, Friday and Saturday they changed the chicane again so it was the strike was obviously about one second faster than on, on Friday so I think we still are the fastest car in the field okay he's very confident that's it would you care to respond, Mr. Bell? He says, you're not the fastest car in the field. Well, the proof's in the pudding, and as they say, when the flag drops, the bullshit stops. So we're going to see, won't we? Outside <laughs> row one is your European teammate, Hans Stuck. Today, you're certainly not teammates. We're going to hear from him. Any uh, words of wisdom for Hans? Well, I'd just like to remind him that, in fact, I'm not beside him this week. I'm behind him, so better look in his mirrors. Let's give Jerry Garrett the opportunity to remind Herr Stuck of that fact. He is with okay, the outside Hans, pole your, sitter. Your former uh, teammate, Derek Bell, says that he wants to remind you that uh, he's behind you. That you're, you've got to watch out for him. 
Yeah, unfortunately, I have to watch out for him here because, uh, as he probably told, normally we are sitting in the same car together. But here he is in the Löwenbräu car and he has a little bit of a better machine. So when he comes from the back, I have to move out of his way. But wait, it's coming the other way around this year. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's the front row. Two Germans in the front row. Klaus Ludwig, victorious at Laguna Seca. And along beside him comes Hans Stuck, son of a former Formula One champion of many years ago back in the 30s. And then, of course, that Derek Bell, Al Holbert car would be coming up next. Well, thank you, Dave. There are so many stories for the Charlotte Grand Prix. After the Ford victory of the last outing at Laguna Seca, California, and the Chevrolet Corvette win at Road Atlanta, is the Porsche parade after 17 years grinding to a halt. Will we have a seventh different winner in seven races this year here in the Charlotte Grand Prix? Or will that fabulous Ford probe make it two in a row with West Germany's Klaus Ludwig? Those are some of the stories, but I believe the overriding issue here is a matter of mere survival. Who can withstand the rigors of this Charlotte track? Well, the Charlotte Speedway has always been one of the most difficult, if not the most, on the entire Camel GT series. But now we have additional problems. Look at what has happened this week. We're running into problems with a new chicane built halfway down the back straight, originally designed to reduce the speeds which are reaching ridiculous proportions through the high speed bankings of turns three and four. Something to take away accidents, and yet it's done just the opposite. We've had far more incidents, and what we suffer is potentially an accident today that could actually block the entire track and put a stoppage to the race temporarily. They were trying to slow the cars down some. They'll still reach an excess of 175 miles per hour coming off the banking. It should be quite a day. Earlier, we showed you that frightening three-car crash at uh, Riverside, California, in which the Doc Bundy and Cyril Vandermeer cars, uh, where a car was destroyed, that Corvette. Well, a new spirit of Charlotte has been put together hastily for today's race, and the driver who miraculously walked away from that end-over-end -end airborne crash is standing by with Chris Economaki. Oh, you guys always do that. I'm, I'm with Doc Bundy here. They've just gotten the car started. It's arriving at the grid late. Are there problems, Doc? No, just uh, the normal last minute, get your car ready to go. It's a new car, so we're working on it, obviously, right up until grid time. You told me earlier that it doesn't fit you very well, that you're going to have to race on your tiptoes. How much of a problem will that be? Well, I can tell you better in the later stages of the race. After I'm out there for about 35 laps, then, you know, it may develop pains. We'll see. Doc, after the Riverside crash, and uh, apparently uh, you were in a place where perhaps you shouldn't have been, has there, has there been any uh, <clears throat> disciplinary action or any wrist slapping as far as you're concerned? No, none whatsoever. It's all on how you view it. Uh, all my indicators said there was an opening. I thought the other cars had a problem. I shot in the opening. There was no problem until I was there. <laughs> so that's racing. Okay, it doesn't bother you. Put it out of your mind. That's right. It's past now. We got to go on with today. Yep. Today, very hot. Track looks a bit slippery. What are the problems going to be the face you guys? Well, for us personally, we're running very hot on the inner core, which is robbing our power. And in fact, it cost us an engine on Friday in qualifying. So we're going to run a very conservative pace. We must run a conservative pace and try to make the engine live to the end. Okay, let's hope it does. Thanks very much from Doc Bundy. Thanks, Field preparing for the start very shortly. They'll be turning them loose around this 2.25 mile, nine turn course. Let's look at it now. And with the help of an eight time IMSA winner, it'll be Bill Adam to give you the description of what this track is all about. Our view of the Charlotte front straight is coming to us at over 200 miles an hour as we're approaching a tight left-hand turn, taking us out of the infield portion. Very, very hard braking. You're down to second gear after being in fifth, and gentle acceleration through here. Little flash up into third gear and being very, very gentle. We've got an increasing radius left-hander, an increasing radius right, and then back to right-hand 90-degree turn down to second gear. Hard on the power coming out, using all the horsepower available up to third, up to fourth, and then gentle on the brakes once again as we have an uphill right-hand corner. Down to third gear, little crest of a hill here. The car wants to get light, the back end tries to come around, and down to second as we accelerate through a gentle left. We're just about the point entering the bank and getting ready for the high-speed sections, and right here we have a bang, rough on the car. 
You feel that right through the car, up into third, up into fourth, using all the horsepower we've got. We want more at this point. Now the chicane, the new tricky spot in the track, down to fourth for a brief flash through and then hard on the gas, getting that acceleration once again. Red line in fourth gear, up into fifth. We're at 180, 190, 200 miles an hour at this point. Incredibly fast, and look at the bumps. You think we don't work? It's very hard work out there. Down the front straight, getting set up for a dangerous turn one. Hard on the brakes. Look at the smoke off the tires ahead. And entering turn one, you've got to be very careful. Look what can happen here. Last year's incident could have been extremely serious. Thankfully, no injuries. Field is preparing now for the start. They're moving the Corvette, the Rick Hendrick car, into its position. And with that car in place, I think the entire field... Ah, the last car to come out will be the BF Goodrich car, the new BF Goodrich car. They've had uh, to work on that car right to the final moment. They had anticipated a lot of opportunity to practice the car. There's the camera car, which will be the number 68 for this race. And uh, the drivers in that machine will be Darren Brassfield and John Morton and you're inside the car, it's up against the wall, and remember the drivers are on the right-hand side, so they uh, really get an interesting view coming off this banking. It does, it gets very exciting from a driving standpoint. When you're running any car over 200 miles an hour, you're sitting only a foot or two off the wall, you're very aware of the speed. It, it's not like at Daytona where you can literally be 12, 15 feet away from the wall. You're not conscious, but to be right beside it, oh, you know you're going fast. One of the great American champions, John Morton out of California, will be giving you the pictures at the outset of this race. Brassfield standing by to be with us a bit later. The number 67 car, which is assigned to Busby and company, they're moving the car back and forth, pushing it a bit here, trying to get it fired up. They've had some problems in getting this car rebuilt and ready for today. I think the field is about to move out, and we are set for the Charlotte Grand Prix with these exciting prototype cars. Now remember, there are two races here today. As you see the field moving away, there's the Whitney Gans car. Great young California driver. Balloons beginning to go into the air here as the field thunders out and a terrific crowd out for this International Motorsports Association Round 7. Camel light cars in this race. They're prototypes as well. And then the big cars in the prototype category. Let's take a look at the starting lineup. In row number one, Klaus Ludwig of West Germany, teamed with Tom Bloy. They're the combination that won, or Ludwig by himself in the last race in Laguna Seca. On the outside of row one is the Aiken car from Austin, New York, Bob Aiken, and alongside from West Germany, Hans Stuck. For row number two today, the defending champion of IMSA, four-time IMSA champion, Al Holbert, and his co-driver, the three-time Le Mans winner, Derek Bell. Drake Olson and Price Cobb have their Porsche 962 in the outside of row two. For row three today, it'll be Whitney Gans and Ken Medrin in the Buick Hawk. And alongside, Cyril Van de Merver of South Africa and Doc Bundy of Gainesville, Georgia in the Rick Hendrick prepared Corvette. For row four today, from France comes Bob Wallach, former winner at Le Mans and Daytona and Sebring, and Barilla of Italy will team with him today. Outside of row four, Darren Brassfield, and with him is John Morton, and that is John Morton that'll start the car today. For row five, Jim Busby of Laguna Beach, California, and John Austin of Cincinnati, Ohio, and another 962. And then comes the first of the light cars, Bob Earl in the Fiaro GTP, and Ray Bellum from England. For row six today, Joe Vardy has moved into this competition from Tampa, Florida, and with him is Tico Almeida in a Buick. Then comes Jim Downing and John Mafucci, longtime campaigners, and the guy who really started this series. Row seven is the O'Neill Shelton car, and along in that row is Morgan and Blackburn. In row eight, Don Bell, who's had a good start with the AT&T Buick Argo. He's driving with Jeff Klein, and Panetto and Pacetti, the Italian team, and the Ferrari Alba complete row eight. For row nine, it's Al and Art Leon, the Leon brothers of Dallas, Texas, and their Chevy March. Rothbard and Meyer complete row nine. Row 10, John Higgins and Howard Cherry. For row 11 today, Chiseris of New York and Howard Katz and their Mazda Tiga. And then comes row 11 as the field is rolling up on the banking and getting set for a start. The Franchi car, and uh, there's the son of Jim Truman getting her go with uh, Deborah Gregg today in car number nine. Row number 12, and that it will be the Rubino car out of Florida and Ray Mummery. 
quickly to Chris Economaki as the field comes down off the banking for the start. Okay, car 67, tailed by Jim Busby. Well, you refuse to start. It's still on pit road. Mechanics are frantically installing a new battery, and Busby is worried. Now there's the batteries in the cars fired up, and he's going to be in the field, but at the tail end by the time he gets out on the racetrack. A tough break for Jim Busby here at the start. As they break on the start into turn number one. It is the Al Holbert car that rushes into second place. Drake Olson moves into third. The Han Stuck, number five, falling into fourth. As they bring these prototypes, and there goes the Jim Busby car, just entering the field now at the back end. Moving slowly down pit road, picking up speed. Field through turn three and up into the S's. Looked like Derek Bell's prediction of a start just came true right there. They were all able to get by Hans Stuck, who seemed to have a little bit of a turbocharger lag. Sometimes the Porsches tend to load up a little bit. They did, don't run quite clean until a few laps are underway. The probe out in front. Dramatic distance being made by Klaus Ludwig, a very, very fast driver out of West Germany. Originally drove for the Porsche factory. It was one of their prizes taken by the Ford people. And he won in his 13th effort at Laguna Seca, just the last outing of the International Motorsports Association. And with tremendous power, comes to full song out of the banking. Just incredible. Look at the lead at the completion of one lap. Unbelievable. Ford trying to get back into endurance racing. And this would be a major step if they can win two in a row. Remember, through six races, this looks a no one like has won back-to-back. Two weeks back to back. ago when the Ford Probe, looks like two weeks ago at Laguna Seca when the Ford Probe did exactly the same thing. That was a one-driver, no-driver-change sprint race. Klaus Ludwig stood on the throttle when the green flag fell and split to take Probe to its first victory. This is a 500-kilometer endurance battle where he'll be swapping off with a teammate, but obviously his strategy for the first couple of laps, at least, is exactly the same. Stand on the hammer and get going. Price Cobb, they're reporting, is in the third place car that's trying to close up on Al Holbert, maintaining second position. The distance in this 500 kilometer race is 138 laps on this track. 310 and a half miles the distance. A record of some $78,000 in manufacturer's awards, plus a basic purse of some $228,000 makes an endurance race worth a go. Something really amazing at this point, Ken. We've got an extremely high-speed track here, one that benefits tremendous horsepower. There's Look. that battle for second place. Al Holbert trying to fend off Price Cobb. Holbert, four-time IMSA champion, takes that beautiful Porsche 962 into turn number one. Price Cobb following. Cobb closed dramatically on him, running just behind them by about 25 car lengths. West Germany's Hans Stuck in the Porsche that is entered by the Aiken Racing Team. course and you're about to see them get pounded here as they go back up onto that in onto the super speedway course it just beats and crashes the suspension dramatically very very hard on the cars particularly the gtp cars that already have a very limited ground clearance only an inch and a half as most of the cars will try and get down to that legal minimum and they actually do make contact with the banking you'll see frequently cars when they go on there'll be a, a shower of sparks from underneath the cars as the suspensions hit car number 13 on pit road that is the Steve Shelton Brent O'Neill car, the Buick Argo. No, I think that's that's right, Frank sorry, Rubino. That's You're correct. Yeah, absolutely, that's the Mummery car out of Florida. A GTP light. The Outlaw car, having trouble early, started last on the grid. Frank Here. Rubino and Ray Mummery. This is really amazing. I can't believe that Klaus Ludwig is able to stretch this kind of a lead. We've got the smallest engine GTP car in the field, only 120 odd cubic inches giving away literally hundreds of horsepower to some of the competitors, and yet he is pulling out an unbelievable lead for just the second and third laps. Car number 14, there you see him, Al Holbert now trying to draw a bead and get away here, and is doing just that. Al Holbert in his 962, winner of the 24 hours of Daytona this year, after many years of trying, was able to get off to a great start with that victory. The interval between first and second place now stands at five and a half seconds. I think Holbrook's running his own race, or is he going to get inveigled into going and make a run after that Ford? I would almost uh, bet the last 10 years of my life that Holbert will be running his own pace. He is such a smart driver, not only blessed with tremendous talent. Holbert in trouble. Holbert at the chicane seemed to be in trouble. He may have missed the chicane. I'm not sure. Very strange. I, I saw him and, just go straight through at the end of it. And Price Cobb darted beneath him. Now you see Hans Stuck going by. 
I think you'll all see the Corvette go by too because he's got a run at him now and it's just, here we go. This is a horsepower battle right at this point. Canal, no, I think you'll hold him off. He should be able to break deeply into the corner. That's the Chevrolet Corvette, newly prepared after the other car was destroyed. Costly and uncharacteristic mistake for L. At Riverside, California. Well, last year, the Holbert, the Lowenbrow team was so dominant. I believe they won a record tying nine wins in the, the 1985 season. And it looked like coming into this season, there would be no changes, but we've got tremendous battles. Look at this, Hans Stuck and Al are going at it. Holbert trying to make it up. Great oh. battles out there. Now you're inside the BF Goodrich car. This gives the viewers an idea of what it is like. Here we're on the infield section just before we're going onto the banking. Maybe we'll get a chance to see this bump as the road course actually makes its transition onto the banking. We're just coming up to it there. Very, very hard. These cars have almost no suspension. You sit in the car and try and run an hour. There's a good shot of John just enjoying his Wrigley's gum there. John Morton, quiet man, dignified fellow, and a tremendous racer through the chicane. I think we have some footage we can look at as to what happened to the Al Holbert car. And the word that I'm getting out of IMSA now is that he is going to be assessed a one-lap penalty for the problem that was sustained in that chicane area. Here we go. We're coming down the front straight right now. This is just coming past the crowds. And this brings up an interesting point. You're actually aware of people here. Normally at racetracks, the people are so far back, you don't see them. But the color comes through. You feel their enthusiasm. You see the waves of the crowd. It's incredible. It actually does get emotion in the drivers. You're watching it live here on the Superstation. John Morton taking you around this fantastic course as he continues to clear the number 67, 68 car that is running currently in eighth position overall. Well, John will be running a reduced pace on, on the BF Goodrich tires. This is basically a development vehicle for them, and they, they try and learn as much as they can for street application. They don't have the full capabilities of pure racing tires, tires that are developed for nothing other than high-speed competition. But they're astonishing, really remarkably good tires. And they finished first and second a year ago at Riverside, California. We'll be back with more of the Charlotte Grand Prix live on the Superstation after these messages. Halifax. Oh, Vancouver. You're watching the nation's music station. Much music. In stereo. For the hottest sounds. And all the fun of live TV. The winner walks off with the one and only Mr. T Air Freshener. Much music is the place to be. You don't think you can get me that easily. I'm still here. <laughs> and much be much music. You gonna say nice things about me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Become a better person. Get more much music. You want more much music? You got it right here. Here at Charlotte Motor Speedway, Klaus Ludwig of the Ford Probe has jumped out into the early lead and a very impressive lead indeed. Ludwig, the German star, setting his sights on the Norelco Mile Marker Award. We're providing some additional incentive to these drivers to get out front and stay out front here today at 100, 200, and 300 miles in this competition. And note that that 300-mile mark is just 10 miles short of the finish. The Norelco people will be providing the NT2E pocket memo dictating machine to the driver who leads at each of those intervals. Very convenient for making notes as you drive down the straightaway on what the car is doing. If a driver can lead at all three points, we're going to sweeten the ante with $1,000. Now, if you look down along pit road behind us, you'll see a lot of Hoyer stopwatches clicking and timing intervals and recording the split-second moves that these drivers make all around the track. Meanwhile, we in the broadcast booth, understanding the Hoyer people philosophy that timing and everything is racing, are going to be looking for timely moves on our own. We're going to be watching for drivers who know when to move. We're going to be watching for pit crews that perform with split-second accuracy. And to those drivers, to those teams, to whoever demonstrates best that timing is everything in racing we're going to provide one of those Hoyer stopwatches to the driver or the pit crew or whoever who best exemplifies that for the entire day a beautiful Hoyer sports watch so we're going to be providing some extra incentives here from the pit communication center Ken I think the story we really want to focus on here is the Al Holbert number 14 story uh, we are now being told he is not being assessed a lap penalty for the incident at the chicane where it's believed he missed on it. And uh, Bill Adam and I would really like to see what that looks like. They say that he lost enough time 
going, uh, locking the car up, that they're, they're not going to assess the penalty. I, I think that's a very good move on their part. That, uh, even to run down the back straight flat out, there's there's just no way that you could even uh, make up an additional 20 seconds, never mind a full lap. So that is good on, on the part of them. So I'm glad they're taking a wise move that way. Let's go to Chris Economaki. I'm with Kevin Duran and Al Holbert's crew chief. What's the story on the penalty we hear about? Well, on lap four, uh, Al failed to go around the chicane, but he made an attempt and he slowed down and actually lost ground on the track. So they're not penalizing us a lap for that uh, incident. Okay, a man with concern on his face, Kevin Duran. Back to you, Ken. So the Al Holbert car stays in the lap and is being shown third overall. It is the Klaus Ludwig Tom Bloy car up in front and then the Olsen Cobb combination in second. Al Holbert in third. Cyril Vandermeer in fourth with the Corvette. And the Aiken Stuck car is in fifth. Loganberg and Whitney Gantz are running six on the field. Bob Wallach, French driver, and Barilla, the Italian driver, back in seventh spot. And the number 68 car, the VF Goodrich car, is trying to close in there. Well, Klaus certainly has the little Ford just humming right now. This car is going around the track so smoothly. And, and again, it, it's, it's such an unusual thing to have a car with an engine this small leading on a horsepower track. There it is, the Ford Probe. Remember, it came here a year ago, and at the outset of the event, as the scorers continue to keep track of that machine, there you saw Judy Strophus, one of the best scorers in the business. Uh, they had trouble and almost didn't make the start. And then the car went up in flames midway through the race on pit road. They come back, and in a uh, mere matter of one year, they got all the bugs worked out. They win a race, and it looks like they're on their way today. Long way to go, however, in this 500-kilometer, 310-mile event. Well, they have made remarkable progress on this car. It is without question that the most technically advanced car in the field. Uh, we're looking at a vehicle that doesn't have a frame as such. That there is no metal frame that, that the viewers are, are aware of as what's in their street cars. This is all carbon fiber, uh, basically a plastic body and a plastic flame. And it, frame. It's made up of a number of boxes, actual boxes that are put together. And that's what forms the backbone of the car. 1,000 horsepower machine tooling around the Charlotte Motor Speedway part of the Speed Week events that take place at this racetrack. Now there you see the number five car. That is the Aiken car. Yeah, it looks like Hans is uh, playing with my friend Whitney out there. And they're probably having a good time other than the heat. And that's the Buick Hawk trying to close in the Porsche 962. The Buick moving up Whitney Gantz up on number five as they work on some lap traffic. You see uh, one of the light cars, the Panetto Ficetti car, the Ferrari just in front of them, smaller engine. We should have an interesting uh, comparison of horsepowers here. We've got the, uh, the Porsche and the Buick both getting onto the banking, approximately the same banking speed. Now let's see how they compare as they go down the back straight here. There's Han Stuck darting through traffic, headed for the chicane. Ooh. Gets through very neatly. Looks like Whitney just got held up there by that other car. Whitney Gantz, who is really coming into his own this year, has had some sterling runs. Whitney does a good job, and, and he was very justifiably proud when he qualified that car on the pole at Sebring. New record lap down there, so Whitney's doing an excellent job. Studious soul out of Middlebury College, graduate of Stanford University, Whitney Gantz, California runner, who uh, wants very much to emulate the career of Peter Revson. That was his absolute idol. And is a fine racer. There you see Stuck in number five, bending off Whitney Gantz in the Buick Hawk as the battle continues here in the Charlotte Grand Prix. More of the event here on the Superstation live this afternoon after these messages. Until you try Gillette's Foamy Smooth for sensitive skin, enriched with skin lubricants, you're missing out on the smoothest foamy shave ever. Foamy Smooth lets your razor glide across your face so you get a close shave with exceptional comfort. Gillette Foamy Smooth for sensitive skin. The smoothest foamy ever. Here in the STP Pit Communication Center at Charlotte Motor Speedway, watching the action of the 86 IMSA season, and we could see a season first. The top five cars, Ludwig, Olsen, Holbert, Vandermeerbe, and Stuck, have all won races this year. 
Likewise, the car of Bob Wallach, which is currently running further back in the field, is a winner. Six races, six different winners. But with five previous winners in the top five positions, we could very well have our first double victor of the 1986 season here today. Let's go back topside to Ken Squire. There you see car number seven continuing to lead. Klaus Ludwig and Tom Gloy. But there's a new wrinkle to the story. The word is that he missed that, what the uh, Charlotte Motor Speedway calls a wobble. The chicane in the back straightaway. Let's see if we have a bobble in the wobble here on the, on the leader. Indeed, he went straight through and, and he continues to be shown as the leader with 14 laps complete. Amazing, we may have a whole new type of endurance racing here. There he is and he got in there hot and there wasn't gonna make it. So he goes up the outside and continues through. Now, we've also just received word that number five missed that chicane. The International Motorsports Association has a problem. Well, exactly, Ken. You make a good point here. They've set a precedent because the rule said, miss the chicane, lose a lap. They watched Holbert, and they turned it into a judgment call and not a clear rule. They said, no, he lost enough time that we're not going to assess him the penalty. So now you've got the lead car making the same mistake. Question, will they penalize him a lap? Question, will they not penalize anybody? Question, why go through the chicane if they're not going to penalize you for it? Let's go to Chris Economaki. I'm down here at Pit Road. Ian Doss is clocking the lead car, Klaus Ludwig, way out front. Ian, have you been advised that he missed the chicane? Klaus missed the chicane. Yes. Yeah, he told me. All right, uh, has, have you heard from the officials at all on it? Nothing at all. Apparently, Holbert's the same, I think. Do you think what sauce for the goose is sauce for well, the gander? I don't know. We know the problem. I don't know whether he missed it. He just told me he missed the chicane. Okay, what about this great speed? Are you going to slow him down a little bit? Well, we just agreed we'd run at a pace that was comfortable, so uh, he obviously feels comfortable. Okay, Ian Dawson on the 711 Probe out in front. Everything's comfortable, and they're going to test the officials now. Back to you, Ken. Yeah, there could be some legal ramifications on this one before it's over, as the Ford Probe continues to stay in front of the Porsche 962s, running second and third, and the Corvette maintaining fourth. We still got this great battle going on between Whitney and Hans. Uh, they're having a good time out there, and it's really benefiting them both. They're not feeling the heat as much as they would. They've got other things to concentrate on, and this actually is fun. You, you get involved in these little battles during the course of the race, and it keeps your mind occupied. Whitney Gantz has moved up one spot on the Strook car back, so that means that Gantz is now in sixth position on Hans Strook in the 962. That red car is back a spot. He is now being shown in seventh. The Buick Hawk moving, and this weight addition on the Porsches seems to be evening the competition out. It's really amazing that NASCAR for years have always been talked about as having tremendously equal competition, and yet this year, all the different winners in IMSA. No one is a double winner yet, just spectacular racing. There's Whitney Ganson trying to challenge as Hans Stuck moving in once again. It looks like Hans is able to close up there coming through that chicane. He's getting through a little bit faster, a little bit neater. Not nearly close enough to make a, an attempt. At, there he goes, oh, to, and he geez. makes the move. Beautiful pass. Hans Stuck moving up a spot, setting Whitney Gantz back as that dice continues at sixth position. Just outstanding. Okay. Watch here in replay just moments ago at that chicane, which is causing these problems out oh, here. Oh, boy. No, no, there is a real show of talent. That's that Holbert. Was, that was Al Holbert having a rear brake problem. The rear brakes in the car were locking up, and it just pitches the car sideways, much like what you see on TV when you watch the stunt drivers. Now, Holbert is beginning to feel some pr uh, pressure out there uh, as the field moves in on him from the Corvette. He's beginning to move into this picture again. Cyril Mandelberger, battle on pit road, the 06 car in for some service. That's Joe Vardy? Yeah, top IMSA runner. Here, here's Dave Despain with a message at the STP Pit Center. Ken, I want to know if we can take another look at that Holbert situation. Now, that chicane has been a bugaboo for those guys all week. They crashed there in practice, tore up the car, weren't able to run for the pole. As a result, they started third in the race today. Then they ran by the chicane, and remember, this is all Al Holbert driving, ran by the chicane and set up the possible controversy over how they're going to adjudicate that matter all day. And now in the chicane, we've seen him stumble again. We may be able to get another look at it. Comes in, slides, almost tags the 
the wall a second time. This time, I think we ought to give him a stopwatch anyway. He's had all that difficulty over there. It was a beautiful job in saving that race car and saving their chances to win the race. The first of our Hoyer Timing is Everything Awards goes to Al Holbert for a very timely save in that doggone chicane. I would agree. I think that that's really a remarkable job of talent. The point where his car was sliding, he would have been doing something in excess of 150 miles an hour. And to catch that slide and make it look so easy. Wonderful display of talent. Here's the battle for third place and moving into that position and losing that position. For a moment, Cyril Vandermeer was there, but down to the inside and challenging once again is Al Holbert. Vandermeer trying to attack at turn one. Great battle. I was going to say that I, I thought perhaps the Lowenbrow Porsche might be suffering a, a rear brake problem, as he did actually have problems with the rear brakes in practice. And the uh, incident at the chicane gave every indication of these problems reoccurring. But going that deep, that close to turn one and making the outbreak maneuver on the Corvette, the car has to be very well set up to do that. So I don't think it is a problem. There you see Cyril Vandenberger, victorious earlier this year at Riverside, California. And then they had the car in real problems. They rebuilt a car, and I rather rode Atlanta, now, they won, and now... Here's a problem with uh, my old favorite team, the Bayside. Who's looks like car? It, I think it's the right rear tire looks like it's down, Ken. It was at Road Atlanta that Corvette scored the victory. It was at Riverside that that Corvette was destroyed. And this number 86 has been a factor in IMSA racing for Definitely. some time. He has lost the right rear tire. You can see it's starting to flap. Now, what he has to do at this point is to be very careful going around, not to go too fast to the point where the tire starts to shred. And once it shreds, you get these great flaps of rubber going around and can fracture oil tanks. Look at that. Almost down in the rim, but he can't go quickly. He's got to be patient. Here's another chapter in our different winner every week story. This is one of your former winners at uh, Miami in the Miami Grand Prix. The team of Wallach and Barilla came home a winner, but now they're going to have to limp that triple three-wheel car all the way back around to the pits. They're going to lose a tremendous amount of time. If these guys are going to become the first double winner of this 86 season, they're going to have a lot of catching up to do. Here's Jerry Garrett on pit road. Ken, we're down here with IMSA official George Rittenauer. What's the situation with the chicane? We've seen Klaus Ludwig, Al Holbert, and now Hans Stuck go through there. Okay, we're well aware of the uh, problem that might be arising at the chicane. Uh, what it basically boils down to is that we know there's possibilities of judgment calls out there. Uh, we have one of our two stewards, Mark Raffoff, located at the chicane. He is making the call there. He will relay to the pits what penalty will be assessed to any of the cars that uh, have or have not shot the chicane uh, because of the you know possible possibility of a, of a problem. If it, if it could have had a clear shot for the chicane or the possibility of avoiding another accident, you know, this is why that he is out there to make the call. Any penalties so far? No, there has been no penalties so, so far. Okay, thanks. That's the word from IMSA official George Rittenauer. Does that surprise you? It does me. I, I'm very happy to see them take that attitude. All too often you see sanctioning bodies, not, not necessarily uh, only to racing, but in, in anything, where they make one decision to cover a number of dis different incidents. They're not doing that today, and it's really keeping things good. On the other hand, the seven car was in a solo performance by himself, no one near, and just seemed to get in hot and miss the chicane. I think Klaus realized that there was no way he could have attempted to turn, whereas the incident we saw with Al Holbert was a really different matter. Here's Chris. Okay, down here in the pitch, Bob Wallach has just brought number 86 in with a flat right rear tire, and Lamar winner Paolo Barilla of Italy has taken over the wheel. Wallach looks pretty disappointed. He probably picked up a nail or something. We're going to try and get a word with him here uh, as to find out about what happened. Hey, Bob. Uh, Wallach is the Frenchman that has won Le Mans and at Daytona. I want you to run over something? I think so. Uh, I must have hit something on the on the ground. I don't know. I didn't I didn't feel it, but it's obviously some piece of metal or something on the ground. How are you doing with the chicane? Well, we didn't have any problems, and uh, it seems to be fine. Okay, thanks. Bob Wallach turning over to Paola Varela. They'll be going out of here in just a moment. Back to you, Ken. The Ford Probe continues to lead here in the Charlotte Grand Prix with our live coverage on the Superstation. More in a moment. Women, women, and more women. The Life Channel presents women's programming with a difference. A difference in the way you look, the way you feel, a difference in what you wear, a difference in how you raise your children, a difference in sex and relationships. The Life Channel, 
Women's programming with a difference. Catch the Life Channel difference now. Call your local cable company and ask about their exciting premium packages today. Working the 24th of 138 laps here at the Charlotte Motor Speedway of the Charlotte Grand Prix. Klaus Ludwig continues to lead and he has dominated from the outset. The Olsen Cobb car is a real surprise, a Porsche 962 running in second place. Maintaining third is Al Holbert, who is co-driving with Derek Bell today, and the Rick Hendrick Corvette with Cyril Vandermerver now aboard is running in the next position back, fourth overall. Then fifth is Aiken Stuck, and sixth is Whitney Gantz. The seventh place car is the uh, B.F. Goodrich car, the Brassfield-Morton combination, and then Busby and Austin are being shown in eighth place. Uh, among the light cars, the Camel Light Series, that is Bell and Klein leading in that uh, combination. And there you see the Jim Downing car. He's running second in his Mazda Argo. He's the guy that really has formulated this light series for prototype cars, smaller engines, and it's becoming very successful. It really is. that The series just gets better and better all the time. And Jim won the championship last year in just a, a beautifully prepared, a beautifully driven car. He's running second today, but it's such a strong little car that uh, I'm sure he is driving absolutely to his own plan. We just had a word that, that the car number 01 has just pulled in the pits. Yeah, he, and I think 63 is going to inherit the lead there. You see the 01, the bell car. He, he is behind the wall, as a fact. It looks like he is going to be dropping out of the race. Car that wanted Daytona coming in, and we're going to have a new leader. It'll be Downing and Mafuchi going back in front. Oh, that's too bad for the 01 car, which had such high hopes this afternoon. That is really disappointing. Now, also out of the race is the Bob Wallach, number 86, the car that won the Miami Grand Prix. We saw it on pit road, had that report. That car has gone back to the garage area. I don't even know what that could have been. Uh, I think it would have been maybe something involved with having to drive the car around a total lap on a flat tire. You're, you're trying to go as quickly as possible yet without doing damage. What can sometimes happen is just because of this tremendous vibration, you get some serious suspension problems, which may either make a dangerous situation that can't easily be repaired, or in fact you do damage something right there and then. For years we used to say, when will it ever end? That Porsche domination of this form of sports car racing. I think you're seeing it here today live on the Superstation. Going for two in a row, the Ford Probe, Klaus Ludwig, here you see him in the number seven. And that car looks like it can take on anyone and come out a winner today. Ooh. This has always been a strong car right from the onset. Uh, at Watkins Glen last year, a very, very rough track. A number of cars ran into problems, including some of the top running Porsches. And yet this car went on to finish second. A very, very strong car. Very strong. Again, Ludwig stays first. Olsen Cobb in second. Holbert Bell setting their own pace in third. And they may be speculating that the seven car will run itself into the ground on this very rough track. You know, Ken, we were speculating about the strategy for the leader here, Klaus Ludwig. I would speculate that there's nothing like winning to pump up your confidence. They won the last races. We just saw the stats. They set a track record out at Laguna Seca, 120-mile-an-hour pole run, totally dominated the competition, scored their first win. They come here two weeks later. Everybody's pumped up. Everybody's confident. The car has finally proven itself. The team is together. Go out there and stand on it. Lead the race. Win the race. Confidence is the key. Here's Holbert, who has been so confident and so dominant in this series. And boy, this week, all week, as Derek Bell told us at the time, of the show they have been scrambling and playing catch-up in what they call the biggest race of the season for them they are a top team they are the top team right now they're not on top and they want to get back the car that has a crack at them right now is the Porsche 962 of Olsen and Cobb that's the car that won at Riverside back in April here's Jerry Garrett well, we're down here in the garage area right now, Ken, with Jeff Klein, who is leading the Camel Lights, the small engine class. What happened, Jeff? Well, we were running real good. About the fourth lap, the engine started, uh, started to sound funny, so I cut the revs back from 88 to 8,000. We were still pulling away, and then it just got rougher and rougher, and rather than uh, blow the engine up, I uh, thought I'd come in. It's a lot smarter than uh, spending all that money for something that was going to go away on its own anyway. A tough day for a car that was uh, favored for that class victory. Don Bell and Jeff Klein out of California. Their Buick Argo retiring. Oh. One car off and trying to get itself back together again. That's the Bob Earl uh, Pontiac Fiero GTP light car. Uh, a new addition to the series this year. It's built by an English firm, uh, Spice Engineering, which uh, were heavily involved in, in fact, won the uh, C2 championship in Europe last year. 
and already they've had a victory in Europe with this VRO. It's one similar to what we see here, a That's Gordon right. Spice car. Beautiful little car. Really a, a good looking car, and it's well prepared and very well driven by Bob. Up onto the banking, taking that awful shuck as you come off the infield portion and up onto turn number one of the super speedway. They oh. put I just noticed that there's a trail of smoke coming out of the back of that car. There. That's the Ford that oh, is leading. Oh, no. You can say goodbye to the Ford in this one. He's lost the motor. That is gone. Klaus Ludwig slowing down. This is going to put the number 16 Porsche 962. Oh. Drake Olson and Price Cobb into first place. Heartbreak. I was hoping that was just maybe the rear brakes locking up and giving off some tire smoke, but definitely a motor. Had had developed a lead of 22 and one tenths of a second, but all for naught. Number seven pulling in. No, the the pit crew aren't even hurrying all that much. I think they realize that there's something bad. You can hear Chris Economac. He's saying it's finished. Yeah. Chris is right there. Uh, Klaus Ludwig uh, signaled to the crew. He waved his hands across his face like you don't have to work on it. It's all over with. But they're refueling it and they're looking at it. And Ludwig is uh, undoing his belts, and we'll have a word with him in a few moments after he gets out. It was quite a drive, and he had a 17-second advantage over the second place man the last time I looked at their lap charge. They're going to try and find out now what the trouble is, but Ludwig seems to think that it's a permanent problem because he's, in a sense, getting ready to get out of the car. Drake Olson takes over in the lead now with car number 16, and this will move Holbert and Bell into second, and the Rick Hendrick Corvette will come up into third. Olsen and Price Cobb in that lead car, and it is Price Cobb driving oh. Ooh, Gee, no, nervously that, there. That was bad. That was just hitting that bump at the transition from the infield onto the banking at just the wrong angle. And the bump is so severe, it's such a sharp jolt that it pulls the wheel. You're holding onto the wheel with both hands. By the end of an hour-long shift because of, of this problem in the track, you do have sore wrists. The Pro going for two in a row in serious trouble here today as it came down the back straight away for the chicane that was the first telltale mark and it wasn't going to be two in a row Just for the a ford hopes uh what a heartbreak klaus had driven that car so beautifully today too all over for the ford hopes the second car of course in that terrible crash when lynn st james was driving to riverside california so the ford folks will have a lot of work to do here's chris car in trouble at the chicane. I think it's the That's Leon That's the Leon car. brothers. A car out of Texas in trouble. The march. Yeah, they have gone backwards into the chicane. It looks like uh, the same thing has happened to their car as possibly what Al Holbert did, only they don't quite have Al's talent available. Caution at the chicane. Let's look at it again. Bill Adam? Well, at this point, they're just, they're entering, yes, exactly. The rear brakes are locking up. They're spinning around, hitting tail first. Now that may be a good sign. There's not a great deal of damage that can occur to the car back there, and they really didn't appear to hit all that hard. It looked like the five car of Stuck was right behind, and he took evasive action going around that chicane, as did the Corvette and several other cars, realizing it was blocked. You can see that the wing is still on the proper angle. There's been no structural damage to the center of the car, and the taillights are even visible, so the bodywork may not even be damaged. Here's Chris. All right, I'm here with Klaus Ludwig. He's just gotten out of his car. It was a great drive while it lasted, Klaus. Do you know what the trouble was? I think we have a big oil leak somewhere. Uh, the car smoked terrible, but the probe ran absolutely fantastic. I was not pushing hard. It, it looked maybe, but I was not. You know, I didn't use all the refs, and I was really comfortable. Unfortunately, it broke. That's too bad. Better luck next time. Thank you. All right. West Germany's Klaus Ludwig with Chris Economaki. We have a full course caution. It comes at the 30th of the 138 laps to be run as they repair the chicane. I think, again, we should emphasize why it's there. It's been the uh, subject of controversy for the past several days, but it had a real reason for being put in. Here's another replay of it, Ken. You can see that it's getting sideways because of that rear brake locking up and hitting these tires. The tires, because the bodywork moves up on the back of the car, they tend to go underneath and just lift it that little bit. The car didn't go up in the air very much, so it couldn't have hit with very, a very strong impact. There was the leader, and most of these cars were all concerned about that chicane and what could happen with the tremendous speeds they hit in the back straightaway. So it was put in, and it will be a point of controversy all day. More in a moment, live from Charlotte. Playing Major League Baseball keeps me pretty busy. Even when I'm not in the action, I keep up with the action. That's why I read the sporting news. Nobody gets you into the game like the sporting news. The ins, the outs, who's hot at the plate, 
who's swinging like a rusty gate, who's breaking, who's aching, and which teams are shaking it up around the league. More baseball coverage than your local paper and all other sports weeklies and monthlies combined. I'm serious about sports, and that's why I read the sporting news. And here's how you can save some serious money when you sign on for a special half-price offer now. You'll get 36 issues of the Sporting News for one half the regular subscription price. You'll also get the football and basketball preview issues at no extra cost. All for three easy installments of only $14.99. So call now, toll free, 1-800-268-4559. That's 1-800-268-4559. The Sporting News, it's terrific. Here at the STP Pit Communication Center at Charlotte Motor Speedway, the Charlotte Grand Prix. Top five, who knows? They're all in the pits. We have a yellow flag out there. The chicane is blocked by a wrecked automobile. Hans Stuck has stayed on the racetrack and for the moment is the leader. All of the other top front-running cars have come in for service. This is a break because they were approaching a regularly scheduled fuel stop in about 10 laps anyway. It's a good opportunity to come in, service the cars, get them back out, bunch them up, and when we go green, we'll go racing. We'll see if Stuck doesn't make a stop. I would anticipate that he would. Let's go down to Pit Road, find out more about what's happening there from Jerry Garrett. Well, here with Price Cobb, who's in repose in a nice lawn chair. You look tired and winded, but you had a cool suit on. Yeah, that's absolutely correct, but uh, the problem is there's absolutely no ventilation in the car. So the parts of you that are not being touched by the cool suit, you can f actually feel the heat, you know, emanating from those surfaces, and it makes it very difficult to continue. It's more psychological than anything. You know, I could have continued on to end of my stint, no problem, but it's just nice to get the relief, which worked out because of the yellow. Otherwise, I wouldn't come in. Any problems with the car, though? No, only with the track, uh, and it's got nothing to do with the safety or otherwise. It's just getting very, very slippery, which we all suspected at the beginning of the race, so uh, we've been taking it easy. Well, there's a confident Price Cobb, and Drake Olson's in the car right now. Let's go down pit road for another report from Chris Oh, well, Here's Al Holbert taking a drink. Al, uh, two things. This uh, yellow flag has brought you guys in earlier than you expected. Is that going to upset your pit stop plans? No, theoretically, which isn't very good logic i guess if there's no more yellows we did our last stop first we found out we ran past the window so to speak so we can go the rest of the distance on one stop okay secondly you went by the chicane earlier what was the problem over there what do you think the ramifications will be well they told us they'd give us a stop and go immediately and i lost two positions and he said that he would judge whether we uh gained anything by it or lost anything by it so i i suppose it's a done deal and I went by because I missed on the car setup. I just got the thing too loose. Some of the other teams say, well, Holbert missed it and didn't get a penalty, so it's okay to miss it. Well, that's their business. Let them try. Okay. Thank you very much, Al. Back to you, Ken. <laughs> okay, Al. <laughs> Al Holbert's car, Derek Bell, just going around, Stuck for the lead. And I believe we still have Hans Stuck. There was not a change of drivers on car number five, as we understand it. Wait for I, confirmation on that. I think you're right. Derek Bell in car number 14. Closing ground, pulling out in front for the moment on car number five in second place. And that would mean that into the third position, as the Holbert Bell combination takes over. Oh, look at this show of horsepower here. Stuck is really getting through that chicane quickly. He did the same thing with Whitney Ganson, and the Buick definitely makes more horsepower than the Porsche. But he's getting through very smoothly. That's a great battle. It's also a great story here because, as we said at the top of the show, these two guys are teammates over in Europe. Keep in mind that virtually the same cars with some of the same drivers race in Europe for what is called the World Championship, although a lot of people feel, and I think rightly so, that IMSA's Charlotte Grand Prix is much better racing for a lot of reasons we don't have time to get into. The point is that Hodge Stuck driving the number five lead car, and now Derek Bell, who has relieved Al Holbert at number 14, are teammates on the factory Porsche racing team, racing virtually a identical 962 models over in Europe. Then they come to America. Derek Bell hired by the Lowenbrow team to drive with Holbert and Hans Stuck as the sort of spiritual leader and team captain for the Bob Aiken entry. Here they are, bitter rivals and having at it at close to 200 miles an hour. Stuck, he getting the better of it for the moment. By about eight car, nine car lengths here, David. Car that won at Sebring. Hans Stuck then with Joe Gardner and Bob Aiken. Continuing to draw away, and Derek Bell poised in the second position. Olsen and Cobb are in third, and that Corvette, that Rick Hendrick machine, lies fourth. Well, both Hansen and Derek are, are such brilliant drivers. Very, very smart. They'll put on quite a show for this crowd that 
maybe isn't quite used to the exotic prototypes we're watching today. They're, they're more uh, meat and potatoes, bread and butter, good old-fashioned stock car racers down here, but they enjoy watching these prototypes. They always put on a good show, and the people turn out in droves. Sarah Vandenberger has stepped out of the Corvette that has just been passed by Whitney Gans. Gans has gone into fifth position, and he is standing by with Chris Economacki. Hi, uh, Sal, you've had a stint in the new car. What kind of condition is it in? We was running real well. The temperatures got were nice and cool. I was, I was driving fairly easy on it. I wasn't trying to push it hard, but it feels very good. Okay, but the driver's pretty hot, huh? The driver's pretty hot, yeah. The, the car was okay. Okay, you have a lot of Chevrolet people here watching. Are you going to be able to call on the car for more before the race is over and perhaps win? I think if we can keep at this pace, we'll have a bit of reserve at the end, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sal Vandermeer for the South African living in Indianapolis, co-driving the Corvette number 52. Back to you. 34 of 138 laps are now complete. You see Stuck now in front, Derek Bell in second. The West German leading the Great Britain as they come down to turn one. That's right where that number five car was destroyed a year ago when John Paul had a brake lock up, spun across the grass and went right into the side of car number five and parked him in the wall. Look at, I think Hans has got some sort of a tire problem here. The back end of his car is sliding noticeably. Just the, the last lap, all of a sudden, it has really been getting tail happy. Most of ca Stroke's cars looked at, remember Sebring, <laughs> where he came around the last turn totally sideways? Uh, he, he is spectacular. He has just put on displays the likes of which I have never seen. Hans Stuck in first, Derek Bell in second. Derek's yeah, in field portion at the bit. Just wants to get that uh, number 14 car right up alongside and past him. Running a very strong race, the Olsen Cobb combination in third. And for the moment, Whitney Gans has put the Buick Hawk into the fourth position. Ian Lobenberg, and then back to fifth has fallen Doc Bundy, now driving in the Corvette. Good scrap up in front. Excellent. Very good racing. Now you see that long straightaway into the banking, hence that chicane. They were just so concerned that tires would have a terrible time at the tremendous speeds. Without that chicane, these cars were three and four seconds a lap faster than just one year ago. Well, it's, it's quite amazing. They, they not only have developed horsepower, but also the tire development is constantly going on. And they're getting the G-forces that they're able to obtain are just... No, look, there was just another example. Stuck's car is definitely getting loose in the back end. I think he may be having some sort of a tire problem, either through temperature or possibly a slight puncture. But watch it going into a corner, and you'll see the same thing as what, what troubled Al Holbert, where the back end was sliding out under braking. Stuck's car is doing it. Bill Adam, Bill Adam, let me ask you a question here. We mentioned these guys are teammates. It would seem they would know a lot about each other's driving styles. But on the other hand, I'm wondering if that might be a false impression. I mean, they're, when they're teammates driving the same car, they're never out there together. Do these guys know very much about each other's racing style? Will that have any factor in this battle we're seeing right now? No, they, they probably won't know the racing style, but they certainly understand the psychology. When you have to spend a, a 12 hour, a 24 hour race with someone, and you're trying to get that car to live as well as to go very quickly in it, you have to know your, your co-driver intimately, just be very, very close and almost be able to think exactly the same thoughts. Second question, as we watch Stuck and watch Bell in pursuit, it seems that Stuck is just eating him alive on the straightaways. They get to the infield and it's all Derek Bell. Is that because of that handling problem? I think it is. It, it looks like Derek is picking up under braking and the uh, low and brow car is going into the corners much better than the Coca-Cola car. And third place is right there. There's the oh. third place car. Jeez, now he Very had a long quickly. slide there. Let's talk about this guy, too. Now, this is Drake Olson, who has climbed into that machine. He has replaced Price Cobb. There goes Bell into the lead. Bell takes advantage of an apparent Stuck handling problem. He has grabbed the lead, and for the first time today, the defending champion's car, the fastest car in qualifying, is out front at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Olsen is charging. This guy is a charger by definition, and he's going after Stuck. Tremendous race for the top three, kid. We'll come back and talk about Drake Olsen in a moment. Here's Olsen going for that second position on Stuck as they come to the chicane. 39th lap is what they're working right now with Derek Bell back in front, Stuck in second. Well, you're right. It, it does appear that Stuck does have a horsepower advantage. That car is running very, very quickly and gets through the chicane, I think, better than anyone today. We have one car running very oh, slowly on the track, and Hol the Holbert's Holbert car. car came out of the chicane in trouble. It is slowing down. We have a new leader. Stuck is now in front. Coming to second is Drake Olson. Well, Derek's bringing the car down pit lane. I can't get any indication of what might be a problem. Pit reporter standing by as Derek Bell brings number 14 defending champion onto pit road. No 
nobody's working on tires, so it's not a not a suspension problem. I think it has to be mechanical. Boat, yeah, the rear deck is coming off. Just mean, have to meanwhile, a tremendous battle for the lead continues to develop. There comes Drake Olsen moving up on Stuck as they battle for first place through the S's. See once again, Stuck's car sliding on the back end. He's trying to put the power down, but he can't. It just won't take it at this point. Here they are, side by side into the banking. Drake has got him this time, unless Stuck just outpowers him once again. No, Hans actually let him by there. He probably shifted 500 revs earlier than he could because he knew that he couldn't go as deeply, as close to the chicane as what Drake Olsen was going to go and didn't want to put Drake into a dangerous position. Jerry Garrett. Well, Chris, right down here in the, the pits for Derek Bell and Al Holbert were standing by to see what's happened to the car. The engine is off right now. Derek Bell has unstrapped himself and gotten out. The uh, crew's looking at the engine, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of hope for getting whatever was solved quickly. And they've gone a lap down to these two leaders. Jeez. Car number five almost in trouble getting nearly nailed and he had to really step out of it as the BF Goodrich car number 68 moved out there coming through turn three. Just that Stuck's tremendous ability saved the car right there. He was getting sideways very quickly. That's 125 mile an hour point in the track and he was getting totally sideways as he went out of our picture. And yet here he is, he's carrying on. Gets back up and collects that car. Stuck is able to drive a car more sideways than anyone. Here's an excellent shot. Coming out of the banking again, that severe bump once more. Look at the vibration. Excellent Number shot. Number 68 car going down into that chicane. This is 750, 760 horsepower behind you. It's pushing, accelerating this car so quickly. For the lead at the moment, Olsen-Cobb combination. Drake Olsen is driving. And what a surprise unusual developments here today as first one and then another car are attacked by gremlins the ford probe seemed to dominate had pulled to a 22 second advantage and then the ford went up in smoke now car number 14 defending imsa champion the man who runs the porsche program in north america that's al holbert four-time imsa champion and the three-time le mans winner they're sitting down there wondering about their automobile it's still down with the Back of the car, being administered to in the engine department. Ah, picture of dejection. Derek Bell, and behind him, we saw Al Holbert. Hard moment for them. Let's go to Jerry Garrett. We're standing by down here with Derek Bell, and Derek, what happened to the car? Well, I just took the lead off Hans in the infield, and was going down the back, creaming down there beautifully, and suddenly it just went flat on me coming out of the chicane. I don't know what it was. The engine just sort of had no boost and had no power or anything at the end of the day? I think it looks like it, but I have to be ready just in case. But it sounded awfully terminal to me. Okay, thanks, Derek. And their run for the IMSA championship, which many value as high as that world championship in Europe, many value more. That's a heartbreaker for Al Holbert and company. They need to finish this race today. Really unfortunate. I thought they would do well. And they have been going through such a rough season. Very uncharacteristic for Holbert. Holbert's team was always the one that everyone aspired to. Now there's the 67 car that's had all that work done to it in the past several days. A fresh car for the Busby team and it's had problems throughout today. I'm not too surprised at this development. These cars nowadays are so complex. They're, they're such incredibly detailed automobiles to try and put together a brand new car in the limited time that this crew had was just a, a tremendous task before them and uh, something unfortunately has happened. The heartbreaker for Jim Busby and that's been the story of this race and the attrition rate continues to develop here today. Seven of the starters are now out of the event with 42 of the 138 laps complete. This track eats cars. We've talked We've talked so much here uh, today and throughout the IMSA season about the demolition derby that the 86 campaign has been with 14 of these $250,000 cars smashed up in a variety of crashes. Here today, it's been a virtually crash-free race, but boy, are we seeing a tremendous amount of engine problem. You can't help but wonder if some of the body repair work and tub repair work is not robbing from the engine department. Hard to speculate on what might be the difficulty, but Bill Adam, it would seem to me that having slowed down the race track and take it away some of that top terminal speed the engine's ought to live longer what we're seeing is just the opposite any theories well uh, i don't really know i think the uh the bumpy nature of this track and, and again we're getting excellent shots here of john morton inside the uh, bf goodrich camera car that's the hardest single thing on the cars for the track the chicane in the back really shouldn't affect the motors 
you get a real picture there of what a handful these cars are to, to manhandle around this racetrack. John Morton is hard at work. We'll be back with more of the live action of the Charlotte Grand Prix as you watch John Morton currently running in fifth position here on the Superstation WTBS. Join us for our continuing series of World Championship rallies. San Remo, Corsica, Argentina, the Ivory Coast, just some of the places we'll visit. You'll see the best drivers, the best cars, and some of the most breathtaking scenery in the world. Join us for our next World Championship Rally, the Safari, Tuesday, May 20th, starting at 6 p.m. Eastern, just ahead of TSN's Buck Rogers and the Expos. We're back at Charlotte Motor Speedway with live TBS Sports coverage of the Charlotte Grand Prix, and we're watching the fourth different leader in a very competitive race today. Drake Olson has taken control at this juncture in the event, and this young man is a very exciting story. A year ago on TBS Sports at the 24 Hours of Daytona, showed up, didn't have a ride, couldn't beg a ride, scrambled, tried to find somebody to back him during the early part of the season. Then, in Li at Lime Rock last Memorial Day, he was given a ride at the debut of the Rob Dyson team. He drove solo and went out and won the race. Suddenly, since then, in less than a year, this guy, 31 years old, has become one of the hottest properties in world sports car racing. He has recently been invited to Europe to drive factory German Porsche automobiles in test. He is scheduled to run the 24 hours of Le Mans this year, and this guy is definitely going to be one of the stars of the future. And we have now passed the 100 kilometer, I checked out the 100 mile mark in this race, 45 laps was 100 miles, and Drake Olson was leading the race, put him up as the Norelco mile marker leader, and he's going to get the N2T, uh, NT2E pocket memo dictating machine and go into the running for the thousand dollar award if anybody can lead at all three junctures in the Norelco mile marker competition. Dave, I talked to a Drake about running in Europe in those tests, I said, how was it? And he said, very interesting very non-communicative about what went on over there as to uh, how he really felt about it. A kid that was a ski instructor a few years ago and was hitchhiking to the mountains up in Vermont trying to keep himself together and decided he wanted to go racing. Here he is and currently leading in the Charlotte Grand Prix. There's the Corvette that's running in third place. Doc Bundy now in that car. You saw those pictures earlier, that dramatic crash at Riverside when it went end over end several times. And what a job they have done in putting together a car and getting it ready. The Spirit of Charlotte, here it comes in third place. And what a story in that car winning already this year. Really amazing. Uh, I was lucky enough to drive this car last November at the, uh, the Daytona IMSA finale, and it is an outstanding racing machine. I think it is the equal of a Ooh, it's spinning. Oh, don't Doc hit, Bundy. Doc. Looping the Corvette. Lucky. Doc Bundy. Did not get tagged. Fortunate move. Nothing. Nothing to hit. No damage on the car at all. This is happening in the 47th lap here of our live coverage on the Superstation as we're following Doc Bundy in the third position with the Chevrolet Corvette. I think old Doc just had a little bit of brain fade there and wasn't concentrating. Here he is. Back on the way. Let's look again. Yeah, he's going through the corner. Perfect. Okay, he's off the gas right there. That, that flame coming out the back, he's getting off the gas. And at that moment, centrifugal force takes over and throws the whole thing to the outside, and there you see the outcome. He's able right. to collect it and continue on his way. Hopefully no serious damage to the Rick Hendrick car. I don't think so. It looked like the grass that he was sliding across was smooth enough that I don't think it would even have knocked any suspension alignment out of it. There, place. we're back with you live again, and you see him through the chicane, and he looks he's once again at full power. Well, that car is really the sentimental favorite here. Rick Hendricks, of course, is from Charlotte. And uh, just the name, the Corvette, the fans here like American cars. This is going to be their car. Rick Hendrick, who has two racing teams working in Dover, Delaware today in a stock car event. And, of course, that's one of his teams won the Daytona 500 this year in grand style. And he has another super running team, but one of the fastest cars for the Coca-Cola 600 next week, Tim Richmond, who turned in fast time in an unofficial day of running out here at Charlotte a few days back. Well, Rick is really a, a tremendous sportsman. He is just backing so many good cars. Chris? Ch Chris? Yeah. Are you there? Yes, I am. I'm in the Chevrolet pit here. They were all set up for a pit stop, and the car went whizzing by, much to their surprise. Come back later when he stops. All right. Getting ready for a pit stop on car number 52. Chris Economaki standing by there with that Chevrolet Corvette, one of six different winners 
in the outset of the season in the seventh race. Looks like we may get a repeat here today the way things are going as the Olsen Cobb combination car number 16, 962 is a previous winner. And right now car number five, the second place car is entering the pits. Car number five on pit road. This looks like a normal stop. Uh, Hans is going to get out. Bob Aiken is going to get in. Owner of a wire manufacturing company. There's Bob Aiken clambering into this car. What a strong supporter of this form of racing he has been. Tremendous. It was very interesting yesterday standing with Bob's uh, charming wife, Ellen, in the pits. And she was watching Bob and their son, Bobby, in the vintage car race. A very worried mother. A racer and a car collector right there. Bob Aiken strapping up to get back in here and try to win the Charlotte Grand Prix live on the Superstation this afternoon as Drake Olson and Price Cobb continue to lead it and the Chevrolet Corvette moves to second. More than two million Canadians have insulated their homes with fiberglass pink home insulation. Here's what one particular couple did with the money they saved. We saved enough for a down payment on what we think is one heck of a lovely summer place. It also gives us the opportunity to entertain our friends from different parts of the country. What you do with the money you save is your business. Our business is making sure you do save money. Fiberglass pink. Do it for the money you save. We're back with you once again live here at the Charlotte Motor Speedway where car number 16 keeps car number 5 a lap down after that car number 5 was in for a moment and we're watching Olsen and Cobb out in front. Vandermerver and Bundy in second. Let's go to the pits for this report from Chris Economic. Look, you just got out of car number 5. You were giving us quite a show, particularly in the infield. What seemed to be the problem? I tell you what, I feel like driving home in Bavaria in Germany on the snow roads. I tell you, I have no grip at all, but that's the same for everybody today. And the moment I hit the swaddle, the car goes sideways. The moment I turn it under steers, it's just a big thing to go. And I try very hard, and I think it was quite clever to go not too hard. So now we're in good position. We just can hope the car lasts till the end, and we'll be in the top three then. Uh, uh, when I put my arm on your uniform, Hans, you're soaking wet. How difficult it is for you under these conditions? It is very, very difficult. Because first of all, the heat, you haven't got much air in the car. So tonight, when the race is finished, I saved $10 for a good sauna tonight. <laughs> <laughs> he saved the $10. Uh, one more question. Why did you not stop under the yellow flag? No, because, uh, you know, if I would have stopped under the yellow flag, I would have refilled and put new tires, and it meant it would have gone another half an hour more. And I think this is, is too tough, you know. It works out better if you go on schedule. Bob Aiken is doing a minimum of 45 laps, and I do the rest, and it works out better for us. Uh, go cool off. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go down the pit road to Jerry Garrett. Well, the biggest problem on the lead car right now seems to be a problem of driver heat, driver fatigue. When Price Cobb goes back out in the car, he's going to be going back out with this cool vest on. It'll be added to his suit. He had a cool hat on before. Now, Price, is that going to make it a lot better for you guys? Oh, absolutely. The worst problem is that there's absolutely no ventilation whatsoever in the car. So although my head was cool, and which keeps you know, brain fade and mistakes away, the rest of your body is pretty very hot. And, uh, you know, if there's a, a gentle breeze at all, even on your face would help a great deal. So I think this time I'm going to go back out with this vest, which wraps around my chest and back, which will cool the trunk of my body, which should help a great deal. Well, it pumps a refrigerant around, ref like Freon in an air conditioner, and it cools the whole body. The head's the most critical part, but now he needs the shoulders and the chest cooled off as well to keep going to the end of this race. A quarter of a million dollar car, no air conditioning. There you see the car of Olsen that continues to lead with the Corvette in second. It's amazing. It's something that you really don't think about too often, which is driver comfort, but it, it's such an important part. You're getting cars which uh, have side windows on them, and you almost have a greenhouse effect. You're, you're laying back under a very large front windshield. You frequently get cockpit temperatures in excess of 140 degrees. Car number 46, it's being reported, has lost a window out on the course. Car number 46, which is the Whitney Gantz Buick Regal. That car has been maintaining third behind the Corvette. Now, Whitney's probably just kicked the window out. He wants some of that ventilation. I think he Jack Armstronged it, just got rid of it so he can get some air in there. That's something that we have done before. 
it doesn't seem to affect the car stability on a track like this. Uh, when you get to Daytona, when you're under a sustained high-speed area, then it, it does affect the, the stability quite severely. But uh, here it shouldn't be too bad. As our live coverage continues, Bill, let's take a moment now. Bob Barsha is standing by with a motorsports update from the GM Goodwrench reporting area here at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Thank you, Ken. Well, first of all, we're going to take you out sprint car racing. Now, what's so interesting about an Indiana sprint car race on a Friday night? Well, it is when all six drivers in the field answer to the name Kinzer. Indiana's first family of sprint car racing held a high-speed reunion at Bloomington Speedway last Friday night. Mark Spinzer, uh, Kinzer, that is, led from wire to wire. Well, cousin Steve Kinzer, the World of Outlaws star, he came from the back of the pack to finish second in a great story. Just up the road from here at Charlotte at Dover, Delaware, the NASCAR Budweiser 500 is underway at this hour. Ricky Rudd started on the pole in that race, his first of the 86 season. At last report, Neil Bonnet is leading, and we'll keep you updated on that one. Yesterday at Dover, the Grand National Superstars, formerly the late model sportsman division, had their chance at uh, 200 miles at Dover. A half dozen incidents along the way, including guys like Davey Allison, slowed the action early on. Then Darrell Waltrip put his number 17 car, taking over from pole sitter Brett Bodine near halfway. Waltrip led the entire second half of the race to post his third Grand National win of the year. Series champ Jack Ingram finished second, edging Brett Bodine for that position, thereby fattening Ingram's point lead this season. We've got a lot more to tell you about from Indianapolis. We'll update you on Dover, Delaware, and we'll do that on our next report from the GM Goodrich Motor Week Illustrated Racing Update Center. Ken? Thank you very much. As we continue our way through the afternoon into 56 laps of the 138 to be run. The Porsche 962s continue in first and second position, or first position now in the car that was the key car to the event, number 14. The winner last year rests down on pit road, and now there is no activity around Al Holbert's car. They had real high hopes of getting that machine out here and letting Al score his 41st victory today, which would give him the all-time Camel GT victory leadership. That's not going to happen. Car number 16 stays in front. Drake Olson is there. We'll be back with more from Charlotte in a moment. TSN Summer of Champions is here. Sports events you won't see anywhere else. We're counting down to the World Cup. 24 teams vying to be the best. With TSN, you'll see all 52 games at each evening World Cup report with Dale Barnes and Tom Doherty. And now World Cup soccer is even more exciting with the TSN Toronto Star World Cup Contest. See the star for details. You could win a trip to the grand final in Mexico. TSN, the only network to broadcast all 52 games starting May 31st. Here at Charlotte Motor Speedway, Darren Brassfield is hard at work at the wheel of the BF Goodrich Porsche. And you see him manhandling that machine around this 200 mile an hour racetrack, currently running in fifth spot, taking a look over his shoulder to see who might be behind it. You can see the mirror out the right window just to, his, to the right of his helmet there. Took a glance to see who was back there, then stood on the gas, and he is in position perhaps to move up into fourth position here in the STP Pit Communication Center. We are following the progress of the lead quartet Olsen and Cobb currently leading the race. Doc Bundy second despite a spin in the Corvette. There is a problem developing for Whitney Gans and Bob Lobenberg running third. That could move Aiken Stuck up to third spot and Morton Brassfield up a position as well. Let's go to Ken Squire, topside. Whitney Gans car has been on pit road. They made some adjustments and have sent the car back out and it came in limping. It looked like it had something broken, but I believe it was just a tire situation, and they put him back in the race. I think that's exactly what it was, Ken. Interesting, it didn't appear there was a driver change. Right rear, they're saying. Right rear tire was down. He was in the pits for 37 seconds. Maybe we can get a better idea of what happened to this number 46. Here he goes back at the chicane area. I'm going to tag something there. Just coming down, just trying to get alongside. Oh, he did. Whitney. Now that was bad camel light car that he came off from there. Afraid we, we caught old Whitney making a boo-boo. What he There's did. the second place car on pit road. You're watching it live now. Car number 52. Doc Bundy in there. Man. You see Sarah Vandermerver opening the door, getting some air in and closing it back up again. Sarah looked like he just passed in a cold towel there just to give something to, uh, to put on the back of Doc's neck. Chris? Chris Economac. Oh, just kind of left the number 46 pit. 
where Bob Lovenberg came in with a right rear tire that was flat, but the rim was flat. He must have hit something out there that shows the stresses that these cars are undergoing in this competition today. They rushed the wheel and tire off away from camera view, but it was quite a sight to see. Back to you, Ken. Car number 68, they're reporting that one of the BF Goodrich cars has missed the chicane twice and will be penalized some seconds on their next pit stop is how they're going to handle, and that would make some sense. It, it would, I agree. I think that's a worthwhile penalty. Looks like we got a problem here with the Corvette. That car just doesn't want to fire up again. The spirit oh, of shock, uh, Charlotte, a little balky on the start. Going Transmission out. here? No, I think it's probably just a flat battery at that point. And uh, trying to get the car going, having the clutch engaged. If you're loading up the motor, all that fuel going in is not being burned. So once you do get it running, it doesn't really want to put up very much horsepower until it cleans out. Well, going back to what Hans Struck said to us just a few moments ago, with their planned pit stops, not using the caution flag, this stop now by the Corvette, and they're trying to get it started, it has cost them time, and they're back to third, and that puts Aiken and Struck up to second, Olsen Cobb still leading, and I understand we're getting a report of rain from some areas of the course. I'd better pass, uh, I better pass on an apology here to Whitney Gantz. I blamed him for that little incident on the back straight, and it was Bob Logenberg in the car. So, uh, Whitney, old pal, sorry about that. Bob Logenberg has taken over for Whitney Gantz in the car that continues to run in fourth position, the Buick car. Actually, I should have known better, Ken, because Whitney would not make a mistake. Right, of course. <laughs> As we watch the leader, Price Cobb, working his way around here. Ken, I, I want to make a provisional nomination, if I may, for the timing is everything move. I'm still fascinated by that Hodge-Stuck pit situation. Five cars in the lead lap, four of them stopped under yellow. Stuck stayed out there. He said, hey, that's the plan. We're going to drive this thing according to schedule. We'll work our way back up to the front. He has, however, gone a lap down to the leader, Drake Olson, at this point. There is Stuck. Running according to game plan, keep in mind that they have had a driver change and Stuck has gotten out. Bob Aiken is doing his one stint in the car that Stuck will get back in to finish. If it pays off, I think he gets a stopwatch, but I got a feeling they're going to have a tough time making that lap back up because Drake Olson is on a roll here. They've got their pit stops in sequence as well. It'll be interesting to see how this works out. Not only is Aiken an owner, but he's an admirer. He has told me he has never seen anyone quite like Stuck in a car. He just thinks it's grand every time he comes over from Germany to strap up in this car number five. I agree 100%. I think Hans is one of the, the real, rare, brilliant talents in the world. And uh, we've already alluded to the fact that he can get a car so sideways, just putting on the most spectacular displays of control. He's been a great boon to this. And as it, one time he was a Formula One driver mm -hmm. with a fair amount of, of uh, credibility in that series. But in, in this world competition here in Europe and in the IMSA series on this side of the waters, he is something to be reckoned with any time he gets in the car. Here's yeah. Chris Economaki. Right here in front, Rob Dyson's pit, they are ready for the rain if it should come. Here are the rain tires, thickly treaded tires, and there's very few other crews along pit road that are this ready in case a shower should come. Yesterday, a sudden shower came and surprised everyone. That may be the case before this race is over today. Chris, Back to you, Ken. Chris, how about it? How does it feel down there? Is it getting ready to rain? Well, it's cloudy. I don't, you know, I'm not a farmer. I can't tell you if it's going to rain. And I'm a city <laughs> boy, but it is getting cloudy. All right. Thank you very much. And it hailed, too, yesterday. And there you see the skyline over the Charlotte Motor Speedway. We'll be back with more live action from the Charlotte Grand Prix after these words. Tuesday on the Sports Network. At 6.30, follow the National League East on TSN's Buck Rogers and the Expos. Live at 8, the Blue Jays and the White Sox. Tony Kubek joins Fergie Oliver for the play-by-play. 11.30, the smash em action from the Masters of Mayhem on TSN's Wrestling. That's all on TSN, where Sports Desk keeps you up to date on the world of sports five times daily, seven days a week. As Drake Olson continues to lead, a tremendous battle has developed for second place. Aiken is there, but Doc Bundy in the silver and black Corvette is right behind him, and he is closed dramatically. He's taken a couple of shots, but hasn't moved through. A lap marker was in the way on one occasion when it looked like the Bundy combination with Cyril Vandermeer might find themselves in second place. Not well, to the case. No, sometimes the uh, the back markers can get into a precarious position without even doing anything of, of their own volition. What happens is because the speeds in the banking are so high, you have to be concentrating ahead. And Bob was just doing that, wasn't really paying attention. Bundy. Oh, they are going at it tooth and nail out there. Battle for second. 
saw that awful wrench as they come up onto the banking of this course. I think you'll see another attempt here by the Corvette. Use the horsepower. There, look at this. Tremendous display of power. 962 on the inside, Aiken, and up the outside, Bundy going for second place through that little wobbly section of the turn four super speedway area, now headed down into turn number one. Now, there, there is something that we only hear at Charlotte out of all of the tracks we go to, and that's the crowd cheering. The spirit of Charlotte, the Rick Hendrick Corvette, has moved up another spot and finds itself now in second place. Well down to the leaders, Olsen and Cobb, who continue to command the Charlotte Grand Prix here in our live coverage on the Superstation today. And look at him pull some distance on the infield portion of the course. That's a tremendous car. Really, really a sophisticated car. This is a, it's a 3.4 3 liter V6 Chevrolet engine in this, but it puts out something in excess of 900 horsepower. Incredible power. 962 line now in third spot, the red car. That's number five with Bob Aiken driving. Whitney Gantz and Loganberg stay fourth on the field. Brassfield and Morton fifth. Yeah, the people are having a good time here. Here's Dave Despain. Well, the folks were waving to us, Ken, but with that Corvette, the spirit of Charlotte, the hometown car went in a second spot. Those folks really raised the roof. We want to take you back in the field and look at the Camel Light standings here today. Currently, Ray Bellum and Bob Earl are leading the race. That's that brand new 1986 Pontiac Fiero, a new team this year over Morgan Blackburn in the uh, six machine, Fidoto and Facetti. The Italian entries in number 80. Higgins and Cherry are fourth. Rothbarth and Meyer are fifth. Here in the STP Pit Communication Center, we get to see an awful lot of different kinds of pit strategy during our TBS coverage of all the races. We saw this team make its first pit stop ever. They're a brand new team here in 1986. They have not run a race long enough in the season thus far to require a pit stop. They've made their first one ever here today and managed to hang on to the lead. There they are. The number 24, the Pontiac Fiero. And for just getting that team together and coming out and looking so strong, I'd give them the Hoyer Award. They really have performed magnificently with a brand new car, and there's such a sorting out period. This thing comes out of the package ready to race. It's, it's amazing. The, the car has hey, been so over. strong. There's more to that story, Ken. Uh, we mentioned at the top that that car is built by a company called Spice Engineering over in Europe. It's what's called a customer car. We've mentioned it's built, ready to race, and sold to the customer. But this one has a twist. It is, again, designed on the Pontiac uh, body style, and it is required through a contract with Spice Engineering to carry the four-cylinder Iron Duke Pontiac engine, unlike most of these customer cars when you buy it, put in whatever power plant you want. This one is required to carry the Pontiac, and currently the Pontiac has carried it right up into the top in their third race with that car. They won at Laguna Seca a couple of weeks back, so that's a very strong new entry in this rapidly growing Camel Light division. That Morgan Blackburn car is still a strong contender, running in second spot in a car out of Arkansas that uh, Bill also been a hand in a year ago and then that uh, ferrari stays up in there in third spot so there's a good race going in camel light as well as in the prototype class but the big story today is the 962 getting back on the winning side olsen and cobb combination in that car and leading over the chevrolet corvette which is now in second position and you saw just moments ago here on the superstation when car number 52 the corvette just drove on by and took that second spot away from one of those bonded 962s out of Germany. Well, I, just, I love the response that brought from the crowd here. These people are just, just incredible. You sit here and, and you get affected by their enthusiasm. They're out here having good fun. It's interesting, just, just the different crowds that we run across. You, uh, you race in, in Miami, for example, and uh, when I drive in downtown Miami in, in my Buick Grand National, Everybody thinks it's a black Buick. People up here know it's a performance car. It's, just, it's different societies. Half the distance this time by. They're coming to halfway in the event. A Porsche in front, an American Corvette in second. In only seven races, the spirit of Charlotte Rick Hendrick Corvette has five pole positions, and it has one race victory. But smashing success is nothing new for the man behind this team. One of America's 10 top Chevy dealers, Rick Hendrick, also owns the Daytona 500 winning stock car, a brace of Grand National stockers, and the potent IMSA Corvette. It wasn't uh, just a, a love affair that I did well in business, and one year I went to a race and I decided, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy a race team. I started uh, working in the shop, riding a bicycle, 
nine miles to get to the shop to work on a race car. I remember seeing Junior Johnson come in one day with an old Dodge with uh, looked like shoe polish number on the on the side of the car on the back of a flatbed truck. I think I was about six years old then. Hendrick still owns the 31 Chevy in which he set a drag race record at the age of 14 and he was a championship boat racer until his insurance company said racing was a risk to a growing business empire. Today we are we were operating 17 dealerships now and I have five more under construction or I'm in a buy, involved in buy sales for 86. So we're going to be over 20 uh, in 1986 and we sold uh, 25,000 cars last year. Still a racer at heart, Hendrick recently completed a driving school at Road Atlanta and he's always looking for a new world to conquer. Our IMSA guys have talked a little bit about Indy and we've even had some people call us about running an Indy car, but uh, that's down the road and I don't even know whether we'll, whether we'll, if we'll do that in the future, but it's, you know, you gotta have a dream and uh, we continue to think about things to come. Rick Kendrick, a dreamer who has put together some amazing teams, and perhaps the biggest story this year has been his team's victory in the Daytona 500 with Jeff Bodine. Here's his car currently running second. This would be right up there among the big moments if this car could do it again today, win its second race, and do it in front of a hometown crowd in Charlotte, North Carolina. Currently, Doc Bundy and Sarah Vandermerver are maintaining second position behind the Porsche 962 of Olsen and Cobb. We'll be back with more of the live action as we continue to watch and see if that Corvette can do it and follow the campaign of Brassfield, who's running now in the fifth position in this race. The town can die if it ain't got protection. Well, the folks down here wouldn't buy that. So I went ahead and bought my own Rez Woodstein. Rez protection lasts. Because Rez grinds its color so fine that it gets right into the wood and sticks there. Buy Rez protection, I said. But they wouldn't listen. And where are they now? <laughs> Drake Olson from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Driving a Porsche 962 leading here in the Charlotte Grand Prix. Coming to you on the Superstation WTBS. The Corvette, the Rick Hendrick car, is maintaining the second position right now in the race, and let's go to Chris Economaki. I'm down here at Pit Road with, with the owner of that car, Rick Hendrick. Rick just told me that his mind is also in another racetrack. Uh, what are you concerned with Rick today? Well, at Dover, Jeff's leading right now, and uh, when I, every time I put the radio on, I, he's door-to-door -door with someone, I cut it back off, and I'd wait a few minutes, and I'd turn it back on, so I'm watching two races at one time. Your Corvette here is doing very well, but it's losing a couple of seconds a lap to the leading Porsche. Will you speed that up before the day is over? Yeah, the game plan was to run to the last stop and then we'll turn it up. But we knew that the, no one could live with the pace that they started there early in the race. So our game plan was to conserve the car. This is a tough track. Be there at the end and then, then we could go for it. We know what we can do against those, those other cars when the time comes. Okay, there's the plan. Thanks very much, Rick Hendrick. Back to you, Ken. Look at that car snap and bounce as it comes off that banking. That's a handful. It hurts. Doc Bundy takes it back into the turn one area, the nine-turn Charlotte Motor Speedway, 2.25-mile course. If you're joining us now, it's 500 kilometers, 138 laps, 310 miles to be run. Ford jumped out in front. It looked like Klaus Ludwig of West Germany was going to give Ford their second victory with that great prototype car. Then its engine went away. Shortly thereafter, Al Holbrook and Derek Bell's car, Derek Bell at the controls, went through the chicane, and as Derek Bell said, it just went flat. And so, Al Holbert and company, they've rolled the car away. They are eliminated from the competition. The Aiken Stuck car has been a contender all day. Cyril Vandermerver and Doc Bundy have been staying right in the hunt. But the car that is just dancing around this course, and we think perhaps at risk because it's going so fast, there's the leader, car number 16, trying to put a lap on the second place car. As they come through the chicane, Olsen and Cobb. 
Here comes the test of Rick Hendrick's strategy. He said they were going to be content to run conservatively and to give the advantage to the faster car of Drake Olson. Well, Olson has gobbled up Doc Bundy over the last couple of three laps, as Chris Economaki mentioned, at the rate of a couple of seconds of lap. And there he goes to the inside, and that is going to put the second. Whoa, wait a minute. Here comes Doc back on the outside. Great battle. Remember, those are the first and second place cars, but they're a lap apart as Dyson has just succeeded in putting the second place Corvette a lap down. Now the key here is Dyson's pit stop. He is anticipating a stop, a scheduled pit stop very soon. And that may be when we see the payoff here in the question about that Hoyer timely move for Hans Stuck and Bob Aiken. Aiken is in the car now and they're not far behind that battle. Also a lap down. So the point is this. If Dyson can get in and out of the pits in less than a lap, he can hold the lead. If not, it will be the Corvette and the Stuck automobile, the Stuck Aiken automobile battling for the lead. We'll have a tremendous fight, and I guess we'll have to go ahead and give Stucky that, uh, or the team manager, whoever made the pit stop decision, that uh, Hoyer stopwatch. Dave, here's a late update on that. We're, we understand, and Jerry Garrett, you, you need to get down to uh, Drake Olson's pits. We understand that he is suffering from the heat and they may have to pit shortly to make a driver substitution on car number 16. We'll follow up on that story. The leader with Drake Olson at the controls today uh, may be suffering from the, the heat of the day. And as we mentioned, it's 100, 100 plus degrees, 120 in that car and the ventilation ain't so good. No, they have done a really remarkable job this year, too. They, they suffered tremendous adversity when at the Miami Grand Prix, Drake made a mistake and uh, destroyed their 962 Porsche. Rob Dyson went out, was able to get another one, got uh, the car back together. They went to Atlanta, and the day before the Atlanta race, Drake had another horrifying crash at 190 miles an hour and destroyed the second one. The car we're seeing on the screen right now was the third. It's a brand new car, just got it in time. They went out, managed to finish uh, a very, very strong race at uh, Laguna Seca, won the Riverside race. It looks like they're in a good position today. Well, there you watch that Porsche 962 striving to win the 140th race for Porsche in the International Motorsports Association since 1971 when it was founded. And they've been getting toward not really hard times, but more competitive times here in 1986. There's Drake Olson out of Connecticut, who currently is driving that car and has put a lap on the field. But the word was that within a lap or two, they may bring him in because he's suffering from the heat. Maybe it's, you know, there's nothing worse than having one of those cool suits and having it break down. Oh, we, we had that happen once, actually, uh, the Mid-Ohio race last year. There's his pit crew, and there you see Price Cobb standing by. Getting ready. Where we'll be. Jerry Garrett, are you standing by in his pits? We are, Ken, and the report is that uh, Drake is suffering out there. He wanted to come in right now. They told him the regular stop was going to come up in about 10 laps. He says, I'll see how long I can stand it. So it may be uh, anywhere between now and the next uh, seven or eight laps before we see Drake in here. Running a scorching pace, that's for sure. And there you see that uh, what I think is the hardest thing on suspension here. You can see it wrench and twist anytime that car comes bouncing out of the infield and up onto the banking. Yeah, I don't think I necessarily agree with the team strategy at this point. For a driver, particularly of Drake's caliber, someone who is so intense and such a good competitor, to ask to come in. I think he has got to be in serious problems. Now, what is happening with this heat is his concentration is suffering. and He's coming in. Oh, good, good. They may say seven or eight laps. He wants in, and he wants in now. Drake Olson, the leader, is pitting. Bryce Cobb is standing by. Jerry Garrett is in the pits. Let's go there now. Well, they're pulling into the pits right now, Ken. It looks like it's going to be a driver change and a fuel up. And I don't know whether this is going to put their fuel strategy off where they have to make an extra stop or not. This is critical for them. If they get a caution, they should be okay on fuel. If they don't, they may have to make one extra stop, and that could play to the advantage of uh, people like Stuck and the Corvette. Uh, Drake is out of the car. Price is getting back in. Remember we told you earlier that Price is wearing that cool vest in addition to the cool hat, so he hopes to be a little cooler than he was earlier because he was suffering from the heat when he got out. They're having a little trouble getting the belts done up. They're changing all the tires on the car. They've got a uh, big bucket of ice in there and a hose that goes into the driver's helmet. He's able to suck cool water to blow that out, and that cools him off as well. But there isn't any ventilation to this car. You can see on the side windows there, there's only two small holes. Some of the other teams have punched out the whole window on that side. We're going to try and get a, a word with Drake here if he feels up to it. Uh, he's getting his helmet off right now. They're getting the car down off the jacks. It's ready to go back out. Drake's got his hat off. 
Drake, how are you feeling right now? Are you pretty hot? Yeah, I'm a little hot. Well, we got a good lap. I mean, a good lead, so decided not to take any chances to come in. Do you have to make an extra stop now for fuel? Are you off on your fuel stop? I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, the best thing, though, is they come in. I was feeling hot. Didn't want to take any chances, so I came in. I don't think the cool suit system was working properly. It, I wasn't getting any cooler, that's for sure. Go cool off. Take it easy. Never seen him look older. Drake Olson was in for 59 and four tenths of a second. Now Price Cobb is driving the car and staying out in front. We have some soothing news here for Drake Olson because scoring is now reporting that even though they lost a full lap on that pit stop, that indeed the second and third place cars were not one but two laps down. So the Price Cobb and Drake Olson entry now in the hands of the cool Price Cobb still has a one lap lead at this point, even though they gave up a full lap of that lead. Perhaps more critically by our calculations, they are definitely looking at one more stop. They were able to run 50 uh, laps on a tank of fuel and they have stopped with some 60 to go so in all likelihood they are off on their fuel strategy now and will have to make one additional pit stop that will in all probability cost the most of that remaining lap and we could get a great race to the finish we'll be back with more of the charlotte grand prix here on the superstation as the porsche battles the chevrolet after these messages Jack Nicklaus for the first time reveals his secrets for a winning game on this exclusive two-hour video cassette. Jack Nicklaus, Golf My Way. The rules allow 14 different clubs. Fortunately, you only have to learn one swing. But the hard fact is that grip, aim, posture, and ball position account for at least 80% of good shot making. Does this shot scare you? Well, it really shouldn't. Let me show you the short game. Chipping is technique is a game in itself. Putting is no different than any other golf shot. This Golf My Way series is the one I've always hoped and planned to do just once in my lifetime. And I'm very excited about the way it's turned out. Call 1-800-268-6365. Only $89.95 plus $3 per copy for insured shipping. Please specify VHS or beta. Have your credit card ready and call now. 1-800-268-6365 and ask for operator 5681. We're back at Charlotte Motor Speedway, live TBS Sports coverage of the Charlotte Grand Prix on a hot, muggy, and cloudy afternoon here at Charlotte Motor Speedway. And as we watch the action, the new third-place car is number 46, currently in the hands of Whitney Gans. Gans has moved into that third spot just about two laps ago while we were away in commercial, moving around Bob Aiken, and we may see an interval here. It's a big gap. It didn't take Gans long to go by, and once he went by, he is really putting a lot of distance on the Bob Aiken car. There you see Aiken just coming into your frame, and we're talking about a couple of seconds of advantage here in just about a lap. It is clear, I think, uh, Bill Adam, that Gans is definitely either running more boost or certainly a faster race pace than Bob Aiken. Here is your leader, and again, we have had a driver change there as Price Cobb has gone in. I would expect that uh, Whitney has had the boost turned up. Uh, now, this year, the 1986 rules, of course, the driver doesn't have that option any longer. Now, the boost control knob is actually outside the car, and the crew chief or one of the members of the crew has to do it during a pit stop. But at this point in a race, you're getting near the end, and if there is going to be a sprint, you've got to try for it now. The car has run well for them today. The, the Buick engine has always been just a powerhouse in this car, so I think it is time. Whitney, too, he's ready for a charge. He likes to get out there and have a real good go at it. Bill, let me ask you a question. As these tracks rack up for, for difficulty, where, where would you place Charlotte? No doubt in my mind at all. As far as a, a driver fatigue track, this is far and away number one. Let's go to Jerry Garrett. Well, Ken, uh, report down here at Dyson uh, Pit right now, the lead car, they had a problem that they didn't know about when they came in. Besides the fact that Drake Olsen was hot and tired, they had a tire on the right rear that had two big chunks out of it. I don't know how much longer that tire would have lasted, so they had to come in anyway. Well, there you see the Morgan Blackburn Buick Tiga, that car number six. It was running third in the light category of prototype cars in this event, in trouble, coming to a halt. Now, it looks rather ominous. There's a fair bit of smoke and or steam coming from the back of the car, so uh, it's got a problem of heating as well. I'm not sure which of the combinations driving that car. The last report on that machine, I believe that the owner of the car was at that time in it. 
Let's go to Bob Varsha quickly. And at the Goodwrench Communication Center, he has an update on some of the news today in motorsports. Thank you, Ken. This is the last weekend you have to qualify for the Indy 500 if you're entered and so inclined. But the story thus far today in Indy has been rain. Now, the rain has stopped. They say in about 30 minutes they'll be able to get the cars on the course and hope to get the rest of qualifying in. Among the 11 drivers still hoping for a shot at the field are Ireland's Derek Daly, Dutchman Jan Lammers, and a guy named George Schneider who has qualified for the last 21 Indy 500s. That streak definitely on the line today at Indy. Rain was also the story here at Charlotte yesterday. But neither rain, nor hail, nor a broken clutch, nor off-course excursions, nor anything else you care to name, including not having a windshield wiper, could keep Jack Baldwin from his appointed rounds. Baldwin went on to beat Tommy Riggins in a 300-kilometer uh, race for GTO and GTU-class cars. The second round of the Grand Prix motorcycle season is now history at Monza, Italy, and it was an American sweep riding Yamaha motorcycles. Eddie Lawson led Randy Mamola and Mike Baldwin to the checkered flag there. World champ Freddie Spencer, still hurting, did not start that race. Right now at Dover, Delaware, in the Budweiser 500, last word is that Terry Labonte is now out front in that race. Stay tuned for more news of the day in racing on the GM Goodrich Motor Week Illustrated Racing Update. Ken? Here at the Charlotte Motor Speedway, the leader an amazing performance out of Price Cobb. He and Drake Olson continue now, as the Dave gave you a report just a few moments ago. They have him now by still a lap in the lead. Apparently, when the Corvette was in, it was in for some 45 or 50 seconds. He was able to get a second lap in there. And this car is just running away from the field at a tremendous pace, but will have to pit again with now 84 of the 138 laps complete. Yeah, I think for the Corvette to take a run at winning this race, uh, they're going to have to turn that boost up to unheard of limits. And, uh, I just don't think it's possible. They, they really have to depend on the, uh, the Dyson car running into some sort of problems. Their final stop, even if they should have to make one more fuel stop, it's going to be a very fast one. They'll come down the pit lane, dump in 10 gallons very quickly, and get right back out. So it won't take very long at all. They shouldn't lose more than 30 seconds maximum. The Buick Hawk stays third. Logenberg and Gantz, and then Aiken and Stuck have fallen to fourth with uh, the BF Goodrich car, Brassfield and Morton, being shown a few laps back in the fifth position, being shown at four laps down now. And the new car is well off the pace today. We have number 67. There you are with the uh, Morton-Brassfield combination inside the cockpit of that machine as it continues to come through in the fifth position in the event. Yeah, Darren's looking quite comfortable in there. It, uh, it's so deceiving to the viewers that you just don't realize how uncomfortable he actually is. He's breathing all these hot fumes right now. It's not a pleasant thing to be doing. It's a strange hobby to get involved in. Here's car number 52 on pit road. Second place car. Here's Chris. All right, Charles Vandermeer is getting uh, Doc Bunny out of the car. They've got their plumbing in their hand. The plumbing here has to be hooked up. Bundy's going back in to assist with the seatbelt adjustment and the flashing up. Fuel and the right side tires are going on and a soapy windshield plane is in being taken care of. It's an efficient looking crew here. Not a word was exchanged between Van de Merva and Bundy during the course of this change. Not one word. Usually drivers talk to one another. We're going to try and get a word with Doc Bundy here as soon as he gets his helmet off to find out about the car. One interesting thing the crew chief, Lori Garrett, said was that they would not turn the boost up now, but they would wait until their last splash of fuel late in the race, at which point they would then turn the boost up. Now, here's Bundy sitting down. He looks pretty tired here. We're going to wait till he gets his helmet off and find out if he's got any wise words for us. He's huffing and he's puffing. You can just see it's an intensely hot day here today. <laughs> Off come the gloves. Even, the, even the, the gloves are double thickness. And the helmet is next off. Remember these men, in addition to their flame retardant suits, wear flame retardant underwear underneath. And it is an intensely hot day. Off come the goggles and you can see the fatigue on his face here as one of the crew members unstraps his helmet underneath. <laughs> it's quite a sight here. It's the fallen warrior, so to speak, uh, in the moment. Ice water. And all right, there's the look of a of a night of the roaring road after a tough stint at the wheel. And he looks like he couldn't have gone too many more laps, I'll tell you. Big piece of ice in there. Uh, now he's being asked technical questions by the crew chief about the car. Uh, he 
he's, as soon as he gives the certain numbers here, the, he's got six questions here. Each, each, the answer to each question is a number, 66, 54, 85. He's got three to go. And then they'll know what to do with the car once he delivers all these answers here. It's a business with these guys, and we sort of can't intrude on their business. They're the last numbers. <laughs> And there comes a shake of the head in the negative. All right, Doc. Yeah. You gonna be able to go again? Sure. <laughs> Feel like an Eskimo? It's rough out there. It's just so much G-forces. I couldn't keep my head up after the last 10 laps. My head was totally flopped over. I couldn't hold it up. What about the car and the tires and the track? It's very slippery and you have to be very careful about running too hard, as you can see. I was chasing on the Coca-Cola car for a while and I, I just kept easing my pace up. I got into turn two over here and the tire just let go. You know, we're overheating the tires, what's happening. And the problem with the G-force is you can't get away from them. You have them up in the banking and then you have them over here through two and your neck just never gets right again. And then it back up onto the banking and just throws your head over again. Are you through for the day yourself? No, I got to get myself ready to help him out. Okay, Doc Bundy beginning to smile again. Back to you, Ken. Second place overall, tough guy, Doc Bundy. And you can see what the G-Force is doing, not only to the people, but to the equipment. That camera taking an awful shellacking out there. As uh, we look down into the back straightaway headed for the chicane, it just tears these cars apart and any piece of equipment in them. Really difficult. You know, I've got an additional little piece of information there for uh, Chris. You said how it was unusual that uh, Cyril got out of the car, or, or Doc got out of the car and Cyril got in with no exchange of words. Well, Cyril, with his uh, South African dialect, is difficult enough to understand at the best of times, but with the helmets on, you really can't. So there's not much communication between those two. They get debriefed, as you saw there, and they go through a series of questions about what the car is doing, and they try to put it to use on the next pit stop. Meanwhile, this is the Price Cobb automobile that is leading this afternoon in the Charlotte Grand Prix with these tremendously expensive 1,000 horsepower Porsche 962s. Third place car on pit road. There you see. And it may be the leader got a piece of that car. Let's take a look at it and see. He was in eight seconds, and he's back underway. There they are, coming out of the course. And no. D, Price Cobb nailing the number five. That could hurt that lead car and hurt it severely. It took it right at a bad spot. We'll get back to this story in just a moment as we cover more of the action in the Charlotte Grand Prix, live here on the Superstation. There's heart in this land. It's there and all we do. That's why hands across this country reach for the blue. And when we get together, it's a taste that's clean and true. So when you call, when you call then you call for the blue. You know it's got to be blue. That's why you call for the blue. We're back at uh, Charlotte Motor Speedway, and all of you regular followers of TBS Sports coverage of motorsports know that on Motor Week Illustrated each week, we pick the champion spark plug, racer of the week. But when we go off to cover these events live for you, we vote for the racer of the day, and it works like this. Ken Squire always votes for somebody from Vermont. Bill Adam always hedges, waffles a little bit because he's a driver and he's got to get back out there with those guys and doesn't want to face that why didn't you vote for me sort of talk. Jerry Garrett votes for somebody different just because he's cantankerous. And Chris Economaki votes for his favorite night of the roaring road with a wonderfully colorful explanation that I can never understand. Today, we may have a very, very easy ballot at the end of the race. We have just passed the Norelco Mile Marker Award, mile post number two. 200 miles are in the book. Drake Olson led at the first mark. Price Cobb has taken the second mile marker award. He's going to get the NT2E pocket memo dictating machine from Norelco, and this team is in the running for $1,000 if they can sweep the top three here. The vote for the racer of the day right now 
Looks like one of these two guys to me. Let's go back topside and Ken Squire. Indeed, after the champion race of the day, not much question about it. They can keep it together as they are right now for Price, uh, Cobb, and Drake Olson. Let's take a look and replay again with Bill Adam here as to what happened when they came out of the infield portion of the course and up onto the banking of turn number one when the leader, there you see him, the car in second place, the red car, that is the uh, car that is being shown in fourth, gets tagged. Well, Price had a good run going on the banking. He's holding the car as low as he can. Bob Aiken, even though the car, even though Price's car was fractionally ahead, he just simply let his mind wander, and it drifted down rather than Price going up. Now, he came in once, and he overshot his pits by a bit, and they can only make a, a, a small amount of fuel over the car, and they've had to pit again. He went too far for the gas hose to be hooked up, so they come around. Let's go to Chris right down in that pit now. Okay, Bob Aiken, in turn, is helping Hans Stuck get reestablished in the car. We're looking at the right-hand side of the number five car. We don't see any damage. You're changing all four tires on it. In fact, whatever kind of contact was made must have been rather slight because we don't see any marks on the car. Bob Aiken is coming our way. We're going to get a word with him on it now. Let's find out just exactly what happened uh, in that incident on the track. Aiken stopped. They checked and found the car was okay. And then he continued on. So here's Bob now. And Bob, you, you had a little shut uh, up in the corner there. Uh, you stopped, everything is all right? Well, I had a really bad vibration. And with, uh, you know, everyone's concerned about tires, I just wanted to come in and have them take a look at it. Yeah. What, what happened on the track that you guys came together? I, it's lightly touched uh, either Olsen or, or the Dyson car, you know. It was my fault. I saw the green flag and I thought he was going to go above me. Instead of that, he went below me. I should have looked in my mirror. I was actually pulling down to let him go above me. My fault. How tough is it out there? You're panting, everybody's talking with the sweat. It must be a grueling day. Well, you know, it really isn't that bad. It, 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 you know, we're all concerned about the conditions of the track and the, the speeds on the bank and uh, gives you pause every time you head into that banking. But the rest of the track's holding up for it. It's not bad at all. Okay, thank you very much, Bob Aiken. Back top side. A true gentleman of the sport, Bob Aiken, who said it was his fault. Absolutely. You don't very often get somebody admitting, hey, I made a mistake. Reminds me of Graham Hill after he was taken out of the Mexican Grand Prix, cost him his third world championship. And he really got taken out by another driver. And he said, how, how did you feel about that? He said, I thought it was terribly unsportsmanlike." <laughs> Lost him in the world title. A true British diplomacy. Aiken, if they have an award for that, it ought to go to Aiken. It was his mistake, he said. I'm a little surprised. Well, this should be good now. We've got Hans Stuck back in the car. They're going to be running a higher boost, and it looks like they'll be able to run the final stint with no more fuel stops. 95 laps are now complete in the 138 that make the distance of 500 kilometers here at Charlotte. It's been a bit of a surprise as Olsen and Cobb stay in front. Now, here's a bigger surprise. Gantz and Logenberg in the Buick Hawk are now being shown in second place with the uh, Doc Bundy car and Cyril Vandermeer car back in third. They may be getting together to do a little racing here shortly. And in the fourth spot is Aiken and Stuck. Checking on the Camel Light Series, the Pontiac Fiero. Bob Earl's car is still in front with England's Bellum as the co-driver. Fonato and Pichetti in the Ferrari are running in the second position. Then the Cats car, the Mazda, is in third. And Deborah Gregg teamed with uh, Colin Truman, Jim Truman's son, doing an outstanding job. They have pulled themselves up into fourth in the category of the light cars. And they are running... 10th overall in the race. We've got a real battle developing here where the Corvette is catching right up to, uh, I think it's Whitney Gantz is in the car, maybe it's Bob, but in any case, the RC car is being overhauled by the Corvette. We're going to see a display of American horsepower just about this point as they're going out onto the banking. Now we find out who has that boost knob turned up the most. Here we're going up. Second, third gear, fourth gear, up into fifth gear. Corvette is walking underneath the Buick. No contest on that one tremendous horsepower. We're reporting that Logenberg is in the car as they come to the chicane. Cyril Vandermeer driving for the Corvette hopes here, the Spirit of Charlotte car just waltzed on by. Tremendous power in that car. He's running that car very hard right now and obviously wants the victory. As you said, a hometown victory. It doesn't matter what sport you're involved in. That's always the sweetest. So for Rick Hendricks, oh, we've got uh, the RC car coming in the pits. Maybe that's got something to do with it. But for the Corvette, to win here at in Rick Hendricks' backyard, his hometown. Oh, there'd be a great celebration. There's number 46 in and driver change taking place. Lovenberg to get out and Whitney Gantz right. stepping in. Whitney is going in. Jerry Garrett. 
And we're down here in the pits right now watching this pit stop, and it seems to be a real orderly one. All the normal things are happening that you want to do in a pit stop like this. They're changing all four of the tires, putting in a lot of fuel, cleaning off the windshield. You notice on the right side and the left side, they've got the uh, side windows out of the car. So this is probably one of the better ventilated cars out here today, and that may help the drivers avoid the fatigue factor, and that may be why they're climbing up the leaderboard right now when some of the other drivers are uh, uh, lagging behind. Now, they're already out and underway. Just made an interesting little observation there. On the top of the left fender, the left front fender, there's actually a hole where the tire's been rubbing on the inside of the bodywork, and that fiberglass is gone. There you see number 46 coming back to power again with Whitney Gantz now driving the car. They are being reported back to third spot, and the Corvette is in second with the leader, Olsen and Cobb. More in a moment. There's no game like it. Footy, Australian rules football. Twelve teams are heading towards the grand final this September from the Melbourne Cricket Grounds, but only one will make it. Join us every Sunday for the game of the week, Australian rules football, only on TSN. We're back at Charlotte Motor Speedway where we've been watching this race very closely, watching for evidence of the old adage that timing is everything. We've had a Hoyer stopwatch tucked away here in reserve, provisionally awarded to this team, the Aiken Stuck entry. Remember that uh, green flag, yellow flag pit stop situation earlier in the race? Stuck said it was a good idea. They've never recovered from that. They're still a lap down. They don't get the watch. They were involved, however, in the incident that does earn the watch for this guy up here, Price Cobb. If you're going to make one great move in an automobile race, save it for the moment when you need it. And Price Cobb did just that. On the high banks here, approaching top speed as they exit out of the infield, Bob Aiken in a Inadvertently moving down off the racing line and pinching Price Cobb. Cobb held on, took the shot from Aiken, kept on trucking. Nice move and a nice bit of timely driving. Price Cobb gets the stopwatch from Hoyer. Some 38 laps remain, 37 laps now as the leader comes through. And the leader continues to be the Olsen-Cobb combination here in the Charlotte Grand Prix. This would be their first victory in this event. A year ago, it was Holbert and Bell who flew to victory. Barilla is going in the car number 80 Camel Light Series, their report. He has started out in a prototype car today, and one of those drivers in number 80, either Fanato or Fischetti, is suffering from heat, and they've made a replacement on that car. Not a surprising thing today. We've, we've got extreme high temperatures. And again, with this track, the banking is so steep and the turns are so tight, you've got tremendous fatigue in the drivers. This coupled with the temperature, it's unbelievably tiring. There you see the leader, number 16, back to the banking another time. Over 165 miles an hour, then braking, coming down just one gear from fifth to fourth. And let's take a look at what happened to the chicane a moment ago. Apparently somebody got a piece of it, and they're trying to get it around. Ah, just made a little dent in the barrel. The fellow's making their timely move to get out of the way of anybody else. That's going David? You know, that situation has gone from being the biggest story of the week to a non-story here in the last few laps. Guys, we started this race with pictures of all the crashes that we had seen there, all the controversy. How do we slow down 220 mile an hour prototype cars when they slam into those banks at 220 miles an hour, as we say? And now, late in the race, we've had no incidents. There were early shots through there. The early problem of people missing that chicane that we're watching right here at the moment past the quarter pole in this race. Nothing else has happened out there. What's the story, Bill? Have the guys just adapted to it and learned what to do with it and are handling it appropriately? I think that's it exactly. Uh, we, we saw a very rare incident of Al Holbert putting his uh, low and brow Porsche sideways into the barrier during practice yesterday. And it was something that you just don't see twice in a year for Al to make a mistake. But it's a difficult piece of track. And I think they all realized that they, it was a serious situation where they literally could take out a number of cars, not just their own, and, and they have adapted very well to it. See the Corvette getting through that chicane, and it, it, it is just a wobble. It's nothing more than that. It's not like the chicanes you would think of, like, like what they put into Monaco or the one at Watkins Glen, where oh. you really get yourself into a curb and have all kinds of problems. Yeah, now, thankfully. Now, some of the other categories of cars that have run here, uh, such as in the GTO, GTU, when they gang up and try to get through there, there just isn't that much room, and the thing was getting center punched and beaten up. Now that we're down to about, I think, 18 cars remaining here, 
got a room to get a clean shot in there, and it doesn't seem to be bothering. Yeah, they're, they're driving very well. I, I'm really impressed with the caliber of, of driving today. And quite frankly, I didn't think it would be this good. I thought that there was going to be a major incident during the race, and I'm, I'm very glad that I'm wrong. Scores keeping an active account of what's going on here today is car number 68. The Brassfield Morton car in fifth place winds its way through the infield portion of the course. Yeah, they've had a relatively uneventful day. They just keep soldiering on here. Uh, they haven't had any troubles that we've seen. There have been no tire problems with them, and on and on. There goes the Corvette up around them again. Oh, excellent shot. There's 750. Notice, notice that the, G, the D has been shaken right out of there. I mean, the camera, the car, everything. The, that Goodrich uh, announcement on the dashboard, some of that's missing. Yeah. That's strictly from vibration. It, it's so intense. It's, uh, it's unfortunate that you really can't experience the full feeling of being in the car, but this is coming very close to it. An impressionistic art for a moment. Here's Jerry Garrett. I'm here with Bob Lobenberg, who just got out of the uh, third place car now. It is the Buick Hawk. And you have the cool suit, the cool vest, the cool hat, all that stuff, and you're soaking wet. Well, yeah, the, the ice only lasts so long in the cool chest, and we w weren't expecting to come in quite at the particular time we did, so we didn't get refreshed with new ice, but uh, persevered. It's plenty warm out there. The cars are able to go to the finish now? Boy, I'll tell you, doing a lot of praying. I hope the Lord's looking on us this time because uh, things are looking really good. The, uh, the track is, uh, is good. The, the tires are holding up fine. The car's running great. Conti's team might just pull it off this time. All right, thanks, Bob. Thank you. 33 laps remaining here in the Charlotte Grand Prix, and we'll be back with more of the action as Porsche tries to get back to winning ways in this event. The grace and beauty of rider and mount working together. The Sports Network presents the Badminton Horse Trials, one of England's most prestigious equestrian events. Join us for highlights of the three-day Badminton Horse Trials on Friday, May 23rd, starting at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, here on TSN. At the 105th lap as they came down the straightaway, this crowd came cheering to its feet as the Corvette took a lap back. And you can see they're still enthusiastically trying to get that spirit of Charlotte to get out in front and move around and take another lap back from the Porsche 962. Well, these people really enjoy their racing, and I think even my friends in Miami heard that cheer. Cyril Van der Merver in the Corvette, now in front of the lead car. A lap down still, plus uh, another full lap, minus maybe 10 car lengths. But definitely on the move. They turned the wick up on car number 52 and the spirit of Charlotte begins to fly. The new spirit of Charlotte. What a story on that car. On the pole at Daytona. And then the machine broke. And there's the lead car. Just in front of it is the Corvette going into turn one. Then at Miami, they're on the pole. They blew up in the race. Did not go to Sebring. But at Road Atlanta, they came home the winner. Broke at 17 win streak for Porsche. And following that, Riverside, California, a terrible crash. They missed Laguna Seca. They're running in second here today before a hometown congregation estimated at somewhere over 65,000. They continue to try to get back in this race. There's the average speed of the event, 109 plus miles per hour. The On Brothers were just off in turn number one once again, and they're back on. That's been the only serious incident, really wasn't serious, in the past oh, 15 or 20 minutes. The action has been up here as Cyril Vandermerver is beginning to put together his effort to challenge and go back out in front. And we know that that lead car has another pit stop to make. Well, Cyril is really spectacular right now. He is flying around this track, and, and the crowd appreciates it. There's no doubt, this is their car. All 65,000 people are here to see one car, and that's it right there. And you just saw it blazing down there, that low angle shot, there's the leader. Hendricks Racing having a busy day there at Dover, Delaware, where they're trying to score, and they're trying just as hard to win here today. And next week, uh, their effort will be again twofold. Their IMSA car will be uh, racing up in, in Connecticut at Lime Rock, and of course, Jeff Bodine is a serious favorite contender to take all the honors in the Coca-Cola 600 right here at Charlotte Week today. And Tim Richmond has turned the fastest lap unofficially, nearly 170 miles per hour in this mile and a half track. When you think the old record is 166 miles an hour around this thing by Harry Gant, that's uh, increasing the speed dramatically. It's a tremendous jump. Just watching the, uh, the Drake Olsen car going around the track now. 
still look at that bump gee every time he hits that i just i keep wondering how these cars can withstand it what punishment that gives them car number 68 is back in the pits and john morton is ready to get back in the car clambering out of the machine brass field morton getting ready to get in john is so experienced at this he has been around forever i think driven everything, Can-Am cars, he, he has just tried everything, he's always been a, a tremendously, a dependable driver. Very fast, he's extremely fast. Saves all of his competition uh, energies for strictly racing. Other he than does. that, he's very laid back. A very low key Small engine repair shop and uh, enjoys that. Enjoys about everything he does. He makes it a point to do what he likes. Now you see Brassfield stepping away from the car Morton is in, and now something else is happening on the other side of the car. You can see the crew chief moving down for a moment to have another word. It may just be something as simple as refilling their, their cool tank. That's putting more ice cubes in the, the cooling system for the drivers. See, they, Hopefully that's all it is. Oh, they are also taking the penalty. They're taking the penalty that uh, we heard about earlier, that they had missed the chicane, and they were going to be uh, charged a few seconds on that. 108 mile an hour on the Corvette, and the, I'm sorry, that is incorrect. That is a minute eight that is being recorded, a minute eight being shown to us as the time that car number 68, the BF Goodrich car, was on pit road. Well, the Corvette's flying by here, and he has really stretched out a very substantial lead over our leading Porsche. Let's take a look at some of the machinery that's out of the event. The attrition continues to build now. First car out was the Rubino Mummery car from Southern Florida. Bob Woolock, the famous French driver out. Then Bell from the Camel Light Series. Klaus Ludwig and Tom Gloy, the Ford Probe, going out of the race early after they had led. Jim Busby's car has officially retired. Al Holbert, last year's winner with Derek Bell, in trouble about a third of the way into the race. The Franchi car from the Camel Light Series and Jim Downing's car. Now, that's surprising because that, that, that thing is usually bulletproof. They're out of the event. That's amazing. I, I wonder if it isn't something, again, related and to this bump. Now, there may be another car in trouble here. The Dallas, Texas Leon Twins are seeming to have a problem out here this afternoon. Yeah, Flagman indicating that the car is not going to be moving by holding out his arms there. He wasn't just daring himself out. <laughs> car number two coming to rest. It was in the chicane where it backed into that earlier but did not sustain too much damage leading it's still Olsen Cobb but gaining all the time is the Chevrolet Corvette of Vandiver and Bundy more in a moment Dodge Aries and Plymouth Reliant take on all comers compared to Hyundai Stellar the K car gives you more power and front wheel drive not Stellar K car is protected for five years or 80,000 kilometers after just two years with Stellar you could be left up in the air. But now the surprising difference. Chrysler K-Car is priced $1,000 below Stellar. Do you want to settle for more or less? At Chrysler, we just want to be the best. Twins, I'm never sure if it's Art or Al, but they're out of the race. There you go, they, they've marathoned together. They've done uh, tennis together. It'd be very hard to single out which one is a miss. They can always blame the other guy, and they are so identical. It's, very hard to spot it, but that's their car, number two, and it's down. And what a job those men have done with Road Atlanta. They bought it and did a great job getting that track back together. You're looking at the Camel Light Leader here, and Ray Bellum of England is now at the controls of that car that is being co-driven by a really top sharpshooter from the United States named Bob Earl. Earl has never received enough credit. He is really a stout driver. Bob really does some Iron Man work as well because he not only runs this car in the light, but also the GTU. Jerry Garrett, can you tell us more about this car? Well, I can tell you something about Bob Earl. He has won 50% of the IMSA races he's ever been in, and I don't think anybody else can make that claim. Early in the race, the car was in the pits with a problem. Dropped all the way back to the end of the field, had a couple of plug wires fall off. They stuck those things back on, put the top back on and sent it out, and it's worked all the way back up now with no further troubles to first place. The Katz Mazda, number 29, is running in second. Rockford and Meyer are in third with their Mazda, and the Greg Truman car is running fourth in the Camel Light program. Something very, very interesting at this point, Ken. After uh, Serrell rocketed by Price Cobb, Price, or uh, pardon me, but uh, the, uh, the Dyson car is actually catching him again. He's reduced the gap to less than four seconds when uh, Serrell had almost stretched out eight. I think they've been on the radio and told him he'd better get back with the program. I, the Corvette is... is looking like it's really serious about making up another lap? I think 
perhaps that, and I'm just wondering if maybe Serral is running into an overheating problem, either with the tires or the motor itself. 113 laps have now been completed. 113 complete. There's that car number nine. That's Deborah Gregg, Rumo's Porsche out of Jacksonville, Florida. And driving in that car today is uh, young Colin Truman. And uh, the son of Jim Truman, I believe Deborah's driving right now. He's a business student at Ohio State and wants to take a hand at racing. He does as well as his dad. He's got a lot of going to do. Well, he's certainly going to get a lot of support from his dad. He is, gets involved in so many facets of racing, from Indy cars to sports cars, to even owning the Mid-Ohio racetrack. A couple of races down the way here, they'll go to Mid-Ohio, which in my mind is just about the most beautiful road course in America, and Jim Truman is totally responsible. No one else. Picture perfect. It's always like driving through a park up there. Racing. It's not bad getting in and out, either. Uh-huh. There you see the leader, car number 16, still there, still hanging on. Olsen and Cobb, and I don't mean hanging on, I mean they are flogging that car and it just takes the abuse and seems to like it. They're running hard. And I think this is part of what you pay for when you buy one of these Porsche racing cars. They're outrageously expensive cars, $275,000 cars. But you buy a car that has been tested for countless thousands of miles by the factory. This is actually a factory that's in business to build, develop, and really get a world championship car. Ah, they're getting one of the drivers ready in that cool suit apparatus once again. I can remember Benny Parsons getting one of these on him, and, and, and the thing got too cold and froze him up in parts. I, I think that's Drake Olson they're getting ready right now. Here's Jerry. That is Drake Olson. He's getting ready to go back out. He's got uh, full cool suit on this time when uh, earlier he just had on the cool hat. Uh, Drake, you're going to be able to, to go to the finish easier with the whole cool apparatus on now? Oh yeah, this will make it a bit, a bit more comfortable out there. I know that uh, Price had a, a similar situation that I did, and he went to the vest, and he says it's like, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. He's having a good time. Well, a confident team. They hope to hold on and pull out the victory here. Frank Olson, likable guy, wants to really make it in motorsports, and he seems to have the ability. He started out in formula racing. He's come into IMSA racing, and... As was described earlier, he's had the opportunity now to go to Germany and do some testing. And uh, everyone seems to think he has a great deal of potential. He still crashes a lot. But the thing about him is he comes back. And uh, you, you think back on some of America's top drivers that have been developed. Uh, that seems to be in the business of developing it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he has. He's become very, very fast. And uh, some of the crashes I don't think really are Drake's fault. Uh, the one in Atlanta, for example, uh, apparently it was from the car bottoming at the bottom of the bump, 190 mile an hour uh, compression. And what it did was to rip away the under tray, part of the fiberglass below the car that, that forms the ground effects that keeps the car sucked down to the ground. Once that was torn off the car, he lost all that ground effect. The car took off, literally. It's that old business about you don't know your limits until you go one step beyond, and hopefully you can come back. Oh, definitely. I, I was very glad to see Drake get back into a car and, and not lose the self-confidence that he had. It's very important to feel that you can do that. You're sliding these cars, like literally sliding them at 200 miles an hour, and you have to have total confidence, not only in your machinery and your crew that work on the car, but yourself. You want to feel that, yes, I can do this. That cool suit must then help dramatically because the business of concentrating at 200 miles an hour and sliding a 1,000 horsepower car and trying to keep it threaded in the right manner, that thing alone would be worth, I would say, what? to a couple of seconds and the uh, course of the end of a race and it, getting back into this thing? It definitely is, Ken. It keeps you so sharp. And it's, it's like so many things that once you start getting hot and tired, you lose the will to win. You slow down. You just think, well, if somebody passes you, I can't try any harder. No loss of will to win thus far for Olsen and Cobb. More of the Charlotte Grand Prix Live after these words. Only you. Just because you've washed your car doesn't mean you're finished. After each wash, you need some Armor All. On the dash, the bumper, and especially the tires. After all, when you're in love, what's a few extra minutes? Armor All. It's the finishing touch every time you wash your car. Back live at Charlotte Motor Speedway for the Grand Prix, and we're watching the leader making a pit stop right now. That's Price Cobb getting out of the car, Drake Olson getting in for the final stint in the car. He hopes to bring it all the way home to the checkered flag. 
He's got a cool suit on now that he didn't have on before. He won't be bothered by fatigue with the heat like he thought he was going to be earlier. He's got a uh, seat insert that he has to put in there because he's about four or five inches shorter than his co-driver, Price Cobb. So they've got to adjust the belt. So that takes a little longer to make a pit stop than it does for other drivers who might be the uh, same height as each other. These belts are very hard to adjust. Now there's the door going back down. The fuel's in the car. All the tires have been changed. The wheels have been tightened. It's down on the ground. And Drake Olsen is ready to go back out on the track. And so, with 20 laps remaining here in the Charlotte Grand Prix, the leader has returned to competition. Bryce Cobb and Drake Olson now with Olson at the controls, and that has enabled the Corvette to get a lap back. We will see if there will be a pit stop on this automobile. The crowd going crazy over the battle here as the Porsche and the Corvette are hooked up in a battle. Reliability is now the key. Who's going to make it all the way to that checkered flag? We're within 20 laps of the finish. Cyril Vandermerver in car number 52 as Price Cobb came out appears to have taken the lead. At least he's got another complete lap back. The number 52 car moving around the number 16 as Price Cobb came down, or Drake Olson came down pit road. Well, I don't know. Price or, or Drake is not accelerating quickly yet. That car is not back on horsepower. I hope it's just a, a situation to be loaded up. Yeah, he's going well through the bank, you know, but the Corvette is rocketing around here. Car number 52 making a tremendous run as they change drivers. He was down at the chicane. He was half a lap back, and just as that car number 16 fired to go down pit road, coming down the main straightaway was the Corvette, and 65,000 people came to their feet. Jerry Garrett, you're with Price Cobb. Can you ask him how he's doing? Yeah, Price, how is it out there? Well, it's just fine now. I put on this uh, Carlson cool suit, the vest part, like we talk, talked about, and the thing, you know, the suit works flawlessly. You know, I didn't get the same heat problem that I had last time, so it was really a good feeling. The car is working wonderfully. Uh, after the vet passed me, we knew we had two laps on him. Uh, I asked him if I should speed it up, and they said, not really, but I did anyway, and, uh, and I did that easily and maintained his pace, no problem. Uh, we knew we had to stop again for fuel, so, you know, Drake wanted some more time in the car, so here we are. You got together with Bob Aiken there briefly up on the bank, and uh, any problems from that? Yeah, he hit my right rear. Uh, you know, as far as I can tell, he just didn't know I was there. I chose the low line because I figured normally we go high, and I th honestly thought it would be smooth sailing. And uh, once again, I don't think he knew I was there, or if he did, he thought I was waiting to pass him on the high side. And, you know, after you get on, the terrific force throws you up. I think he was moving down perhaps to let me pass him on the high side. It was too late. I was already underneath Okay, well, no problems on the lead vehicle now. But the number 52 has moved back into the lead lap. He has made up the two laps. We have the makings of just one of the absolute best finishes we could ask for. The crowd is behind the car in second place. He's catching them. We've got a great car in first. Drake Olson with a lot of pressure on him now. Oh. The car 52 has moved around. He was two laps down. They've taken it back. I believe they still have one stop to make, however, do they not? Well, it's going to be close. They may be able to run it. I don't know how high they would have run that boost up on the last pit stop, but I think they will have to have one quick splash of gas. 138 laps makes the distance. 121 laps have been completed. There's the number 52, the second place car. I think town hero here, this particular machine, not some, the drivers, something the car that, itself. Something we can look forward to, without doubt, is if they do have to have that final splash for the gas, the crew chief will turn the boost up as high as they can possibly run it, and then you will really see some spectacular performance. A lot of speed, a lot of power. Oh, brand new car. This car, this is the first time out of the box on this machine. This is a new one. It looks similar to what your viewers have seen on, on uh, shows before, but in fact, it's a totally evolutionary car. They've and changed a number of things. It's beginning to rain. Report from around the course, from the spotter's locations are, it's beginning to get wet. All right, who's the best man in the wet? Cyril Vandermerver, Drake Olson. Well, Cyril is, is brilliant. I've seen him drive in the, in the rain before, and he's an incredibly talented driver. Being a rally driver, I think this helps his car control. But Drake Olson did a real outstanding job last year at Lime Rock, driving in the rain. He was brilliant. So I don't know. I wouldn't have to want to pick a winner. Well, if it really pours as it did yesterday at the finish of the race, when Jack Baldwin was victorious, you're in for some thrills because watching these men handle these tremendously powerful machines in the wet really stands your hair on end. Actually, I, I would waffle on that question, as Dave Despain said, and I would take Hans Stuck in the wet. We have the makings of 
with some battle here, though. 122 laps complete. Trying to draw away is that number 52. Back to the lead lap, and now trying to get around this course to challenge number 16 for the lead. Porsche, the German car in front, the Corvette running in second. It is a new Corvette from the Rick Hendrick stable, making its very first performance. It is in the runner-up position, and Cyril Vandermerver is really putting it through its paces. There, there's the leader. Going down into turn number one, and there is now an interval of about 12 seconds between that car and the second place car as second place car tries to make up time. He still has time to do it, too. More from the Charlotte Grand Prix after these words. TSN Summer of Champions is here. Sports events you won't see anywhere else. Golf gets into full swing throughout the summer with PGA, LPGA, and seniors tournaments. Weekends are for golf fans, and throughout the summer, TSN is the network for golf fans with our extensive coverage of major events. During TSN Summer of Champions, golf has never looked better. Car number 16 is closing up to put a lap on that second place car again. That interval has just disappeared as Drake Olson is cutting a very fast line in the wet. It's beginning to rain on the back straightaway here of the mile and a half super speedway. We're on the 2.25 mile nine turn course. If you're just joining us, we're live here on the Superstation, bringing you the Charlotte Grand Prix. We're watching Drake Olson and Price Cobb, Porsche 962 combination leading Cyril Vandermerver and Doc Bundy in a Chevrolet Corvette. And there you see the Corvette and closing up. Last lap at an average speed of 115 miles an hour in the wet. They stay in the back straightaway. A tremendous battle. I thought Cyril was really going to make a break there. He seemingly pulled away from the Dyson car without too much of a problem. All of a sudden, Drake has got the bit in his teeth and he's hauling him back in here. He's really closing quickly. We anticipate that number 52 will pit again and very shortly. Here he is. Look at him. Pull away there. Oh, the horsepower of that car. Over 900 horsepower in that Corvette. Here comes the Porsche 62 rated over, what, 1,000 horsepower in that car? The, uh, the Corvette would be the more powerful of the two cars. The Porsche would probably be something 800 range, whereas the Corvette definitely, under ideal conditions, should have close to 1,000. Coming to turn three. And the spirit of Charlotte. Car entered by Rick Hendrick, local sportsman, is maintaining second. A great battle. The fans today couldn't have asked for anything better than this. Remember that Olsen is trying to put him a lap down to contain him. Time is running out. 126 of the 138 laps complete. He can put him a lap down. He feels he's got a little bit of a security blanket here. It would help. No doubt about it. And I'm sure Drake is aware of that. He's probably talking to his, his crew right now, trying to find out exactly what the situation is. Does Serrell have to make another pit stop? Are they sure they're one lap ahead? There's the brute horsepower beginning to work as they come through the chicane. And then when he gets into the cornering situation, all that experience that Porsche has put together from their experience in the world endurance competition as well as an IMSA begins to show. But right here, raw horsepower is pulling away from car number 16. The Porsche, without doubt, closes up under braking and going into the corner. It, he's picking up a very nice amount of time but uh, particularly at the chicane in the back straight, it's just it's an amazing difference. We may have another battle beginning to develop here in the final moments. Hans Stuck is closing on Whitney Gantz's car. A little straw, there you see the Hans Stuck car, and he is closing up on Whitney Gantz, the red car closing up on Whitney Gantz in the Buick Hawk. Stuck moving in, and that is a fight that is going on. They are fighting in the third position. They are two laps down from the leader, but they are fighting for third. This is great. Just what an incredible finish we're coming down to. Lap car, and that is uh, the Brumos Look car. Look at Stuck. Flies through that chicane. He is so fast getting through there. He didn't know it was there. Here's Stuck moving in, battling for third. Whitney Gantz on the outside in the Buick Hawk. Yeah, he's got that. Porsche in front. Let's see what Whitney will do at turn one. Heavy braking here, one of the hardest braking places on the course. Han Stuck, daring driver. What was uh, Economaki's cliche, the Knights of the Roaring Road, or whatever it was? <laughs> That's him right there. Ten laps to go. Ten laps to go. Well, Whitney's still sitting right at his tail. He doesn't want to let Hans get away. 
That's where Whitney would love that boost knob inside the car again. Just, just you know, crank it up another couple of notches. Whitney Gantz saw his first race at the old Ontario Motor Speedway in California. He was about 12, 13 years old. And I think he said he, he bet 50 cents with uh, some of his brothers, uh, a guy named Revson, and went back to private school and then wrote him a letter and said how much he got involved in the race. And he became a race fan. And then he became a race driver and a darn good one. Whitney right now falling back, getting caught on a back marker oh. for just a moment and having to really slow down as he gets into that chicane. Yeah. Close moment. Frustrating moments. You want to try and stay close to a battle like that. Down for the finish here at Charlotte. That's coming up right after these words. Hey, Lloyd, where'd you get that? At the Blue Days locker. What? Come on, I'll show you. Hi, George. Fantastic. It's all official Blue Jays merchandise. You've got it, Rance. And fans can order now. Pick up the phone and call these numbers. Great one more, Lloyd. Tell us more. Chad, this. Get to first base in this stylish pro satin jacket. It's silk lined with knitted cuffs and waistbands. Call now and it's yours with the official Blue Jays logo for just $66.95. Got a good eye for value? Check this replica team jersey. Extra length, tailored body, knitted sleeve and neck trim. It's a steal at $36.95. There's a lot more great merchandise available in the Blue Jays locker catalog and it's all official. What a great way to shop. Call now and use your credit card. We'll include a Blue Jays locker catalog with every order. Make your free in order now so we can see you at the game. And so Vandermeer comes in for a quick splash of gas, no horsepower boost, and goes out in a very quick... Doc Bundy, uh, they didn't need you, huh? No, there wasn't a lot of sense for me to get in, just short close oh. to the end. He's in great shape, so just let him run it. What were you doing in the back of his neck there? I was just trying to put some cold water on the back of his neck. <laughs> you know, the necks get a little stiff here. You know, this is interesting because the stock car drivers go four or five hours here at great speed. You must have a new respect for them. Oh, certainly. I have always respected the stock car drivers. They do a phenomenal job here. But I think we might be a little bit faster up in that bank. Okay, thanks very much, Doc Bunny. Back to you, Ken. Thank you, Chris. Well, there is the car that has really kept this crowd on its feet all day. The number 52 Corvette, 65,000 fans have cheered this spirit of Charlotte all day long. But that car was a big question mark throughout practice and qualifying. Rick Hendrick is the owner of the car. Timing is everything, as the Hoyer people know so well. And Friday night, he made a decision. We need an intercooler to make that car run the distance. So he called England. He hired a woman named Joan Mitchellmore from a company called Rapid Movements. He said, go get me an intercooler. Get yourself a plane ticket, fly to Charlotte. They slapped it on the car. They had no chance to test it. It has run trouble free here all day. They've got a solid second place finish. Timing is everything in racing, as my friend Chuck Trungali is very well aware. Chuck's got something very nice. Can I take a look at your watch there, Chuck Trungali? This is a beautiful sport watch that comes from the Hoyer people. You're going to be making this presentation. We have decided to Mr. Rick Hendrick. Thank you and to Hoyer for all your work. That's a nice piece of work, a nice piece of timing gear right there, and it's going to go to Rick Hendrick. I think he also ought to get the biggest rabbit's foot. There is Rick Hendrick gambling on parts like that at the last moment. Sometimes that doesn't work out quite like you want it to. But Amazing. it sure is working out today. It's in second place, untested car, getting its first opportunity to test its legs here and running in second place overall as we come down to the last moments. It's very impressive. This car looks every bit as strong as it's coming to the close of the race as it did at the start. And it's nice. It looks like we have a real serious Porsche Challenger now. Well, there is the Price Cobb Drake Olsen machine that continues to lead. Remember, Aiken and Stuck are now in third. Gantz Loganberger, the Buick Hawk, running in fourth. Brassfield and Morton in fifth. And there are seven laps remaining to be run here today. Seven to go. This car has been an outstanding performer, and it's been a day when the Porsches have really had their trouble. Look back at what's happened to some of the really top pieces of machinery. It's, it's really sad uh, and, and very surprising from a number of team standpoints, like Al Holbert having that breakdown so early in the race. Amazing. I just I don't know what could have happened. And same thing with the Bayside team. Uh, pa Paolo, uh, Barilla, no luck at all. But this one stays out in front and hopes to pull it out in less than seven laps. But 
Budweiser aluminum cans. Get them while it's hot. Go get the Do you see my... After all the excitement created by car number 52 for this gigantic throng out today, the aspirations of the Hendrick Racing Team are falling back, subsiding here as car number 52 is in trouble and everyone's going by, holding on, trying to finish in second place. Meanwhile, Hans Stuck in number five, running a lap or two down from number 52, continues his way around the course. He's trying to move back in and take at least second position. There you see the number five, Stuck at the controls. Just unbelievable. We just finished talking about how strong this car has run all day, and here he's come into a problem. Don't really know what it is. There's no smoke from the car. It doesn't look like anything is loose. All the wheels are still doing the proper things. And yet he's always on the low side of the banking. He is just struggling around the track right now, and I think he's going to lose second place. Five laps remaining in the event. Back to the line. Looks like 75, perhaps 80 miles an hour on the Hendrick Corvette going into turn number one. Meanwhile, Hans Stuck has already made up one lap from him and is trying to I believe, what, is he down a lap? I think they're on the same lap now. They are on the same lap. So it's a matter of time. He's less than half a lap behind. And I think at the rate that Hans is going, even though it's only a few moments left in the race, I think he is going to catch, Cyril. Olsen and Cobb stay out in front. They have dominated this race completely. After first the Ford fell to the wayside, and then the Al Holbert car, everybody was waiting for the Holbert people to do what they always do. Spotter reports that car 52 just plain sounds terrible all the way around the track. Something amiss on the Corvette. Well, there was none of the usual signs that shows a turbo going. You normally get a, a massive plume of smoke out the back when a turbo finishes itself, but there's nothing. All of a sudden, the Corvette just didn't accelerate like it has been all day. I wonder if we can get a report from the pits from either Jerry Garrett or Chris Economaki as to what may be the malady on car number 52 that's leaving it hanging on, clutching, grabbing for anything it can get as we get down toward the finish of this event. Well, the mechanics here in the Rick Hendrick, Mr. Goodwrench Corvette pits say that the driver, Cheryl Vandermerber, reports there's no boost pressure. He's just running on a sort of a normally aspirated engine. And this car really needs that extra boost. There's the problems you can try again. Within three laps of the finish, and the distance is now stays for some reason just about half a lap. As we watch number five strip going through the chicane at the start finish line was the Corvette of Cyril Vandermeer. Yeah, he'll be closing very, very quickly right now. They're both on the high speed section of the track. Hans is very close to him now. Going into turn three goes the Corvette, and going into turn number one, Hans Stuck closing up. Well, both drivers will be aware. Both Cyril and Hans will have been in radio contact with the crew chief. Dave Despain. This race has now passed the 300-mile mark. Norelco Mile Marker Awards at mile 100 to Drake Olson, at 200 to Price Cobb. They've both gotten pocket memo dictating machines from Norelco. And now, as we pass the 300-mile mark, another pocket memo dictator, and bingo, jackpot. Drake Olson and Price Cobb split a $1,000 prize. They've swept it today. Every mile marker award has been won by this team. They have stopped this competition. The Norelco Drivers' Cup decided by vote of the media here. The vote is not yet in. We'll try to get you the winner of that before we leave the air. Ken? At the chicane, car number 52 going through, headed for turn number three of the super speedway. Down the back straightaway through the chicane moves car number five. Here comes Stuck. On Stuck moving up. And there goes Stuck. Just flying by. And that makes him the second position runner in the field. Cyril Vandenberger staying out there. Let's look back now at who is running in the fourth position. That was the Whitney Gantz Loganberg car with a lap remaining. One lap to go. I believe that they're going to pass him too. Whitney is closing very quickly and Cyril is powerless. What a terrible position to be in. He no longer is a racing driver. He is just a passenger in a broken car out there. Whitney Gann, sensing blood, moves in with the Buick Hawk. They're going into turn number three. There you see the number five car, which has taken over in the second spot. Times like these are just they're so frustrating to drivers and crew. You, you think you've done everything well all day long. You have just done such a wonderful job, and to lose this close to the end. Car 52. Still barely moving around the speedway. And Whitney is just closing. He's right on him there. Whitney Gantz around him. 
and Whitney Gans is going to take over in the in the third position. Vandermerver and Bundy falling back to fourth in the last lap. A game effort by car number 52, and it comes up just about six laps shy of a really strong finish. Grassfield and Morton in the BF Goodrich car may get a shot at that machine as well. Checkered flag time, and it's going to go to Olsen and Cobb. They've won it today. Excellent job. Mark. Price Cobb and Drake Olsen pull it off here in the Charlotte Grand Prix with a phenomenal performance. They proved their car was bulletproof, if nothing else, here today. Definitely. Just one minor brush up on the banking, and that was it. Great day for Dyson Racing as Price Cobb and Drake Olsen have an outstanding victory as they dominate the 100, 200, 300 mile marks for those Noralco awards. That really tells you the story of just how much supremacy they had on the rest of the field. Well, what a great team this has turned out to be. This is their new car, their replacement car, and out of three races, they have two wins and a, and a second place. And the Sebring, the Sebring car, the winner at Sebring is going to come home in second place. Hanstuck and Aiken, car number five, having a good run today and Porsches again have first and second place. The third position car at the finish will be the Gantz Lovinger car, the Buick Hawk, and then falling to fourth will be Cyril Vandermeer and Doc Bundy. That's as we have it unofficially. There's the number 16 slowing down <laughs> on a lap of honor here at Charlotte. Yeah, just see him flapping the door up there. I think possibly he's waving to the crowd and trying to get a little bit cooler air inside the car as well. All 23 cars started, and there's car number 52, yeah. Cyril Vandenberg, pulling up <laughs> alongside. There's some of Hans' fans out there. <laughs> yes, good job, Hans. All right, we'll meet the winner of the Charlotte Grand Prix here on the Superstation in just a matter of moments. They'll be pulling car number 16 in, Price Cobb and Drake Olson. Stay tuned here as we meet the man who did it in the Charlotte Grand Prix. After hours of practice and qualifying, mechanics have the cars ready to go. The drivers have come from across the world. They too are ready. The Corvette is on the pole, and we're about to go sports car racing IMSA style. IMSA style indeed. Our next IMSA GT race is the Monterey Triple Crown from Laguna Seca Raceway in Monterey, California. Auto racing, IMSA style, Saturday, May 24th at 4 p.m. Eastern, here on the Sports Network. Victory balloons going up over the victory circle here at the Charlotte Motor Speedway for two cars. A wonderful performance by Bob Earl gives the Pontiac Fiero its second victory in a row. And for Price Cobb and Drake Olson, it has been a marvelous performance. Almost flawless until they pulled into victory lane and darn near took the door off. Uh, I don't think they would have minded. I don't even think the car owner, Rob Dyson, would have minded at this point. Drake Olson clambering out of the helmet and out of the car. And Chris Economaki is standing by find out how it feels to win one of these things. Hey, Drake Olson. Uh, congratulations, Drake. Where do you buy your hats? Uh, there's a neat hat shop in New Milford, Connecticut. And I go there. I, 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 you're soaking wet. Uh, you, actually, you feel good for winning, but physically, how do you feel? Not too bad. Really, this... Uh, this cool suit that we had, we had just a... We started with the, the hats, and it wasn't enough, but now we put on a vest with the hat and it really is great and so there wasn't any problem the last little bit and it helps when you're winning too you know next race you have the cool necktie right a cool necktie cool underwear you know we're gonna do the whole bit cool right, socks <laughs> hey, hey price which one of you guys won this race you or drake i'd say it was definitely a group effort the team drake myself goodyear team tires team. and dial motors the whole thing none of which we couldn't have done the job okay what kind of problems do you experience during the course of the race uh, for myself, the, the first time out, uh, I got very, very hot. There's absolutely no moving air inside the car, and I had only the cool hat on, the skull cap, and you could feel that your head was cool, but the rest of you was on fire. So when I came back in and changed again, I went to the vest, and that made all the difference in the world. It's like, you know, being air conditioned, and from then on, everything was flawless. So other than that, and the track got a little slick, everything went perfectly. Well, see, a co-driver would like to have the window open. How about you, Dre? Well, what, what 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 was a tough part of the race for you? Definitely that first stint was was hard. I uh, <clears throat> I had all I could do to hold my head up, and uh, <laughs> it was very very hot in the car, and I wasn't sure if it was if it was just me or if everybody else was experiencing it. And it turns out that everybody else had the same problem. So I'm a little bit relieved over that. Uh, yeah, you know, Richard Petty, the stock car driver, says that. Uh, 
you never give up, but sometimes you give out. This is true. Well, the old my body was definitely barking during that stint. <laughs> it wanted out, and uh, but it all it all worked out fine. And with this uh, cool suit, this last stint was really easy, no problem. You know, your car owner it wasn't here. He was uh, at a commencement right. exercise. Uh, would it have been different were he here? Uh, no, it, we probably would have won still. You know, the car was set up great, and uh, hey, Rob's a good driver in his own right. We all. We all do our best and, and drive hard. I think, uh, hey, they won out in Riverside. That shows he can do it for an old guy. Okay, thanks very much. And now let's go to my colleague, Jerry Garrett. Well, we got uh, the second place finishers right here, Bob Aiken, Hans Stuck, and Bob and uh, two TBS telecasts, you've been first and second. I guess you want us to do all the races now. Yeah, I wish you guys would stick around more often. This is great. <laughs> Hans, you pulled out second place virtually on the next to last lap. Yes, uh, I mean, I knew that the uh, Corvette is still ahead of me, and I, I did everything I could. This set I had, this time I had a very good set of Yokohama tires. I could go very, very much faster than the first stint, and the crew prepared the cars. I could go fast, so thanks to everybody who had the top, was just uh, fine everything, you know. <laughs> I understand the tires were pretty well uh, used up by the time the race ended, though. Yeah, but well, really, we, we played it very well. We chose the compounds conservatively so that they were going to last the, the stint, and then we had absolutely no trouble with them. It was great. Any real problem with heat in the car? No, I mean, uh, it is quite hot, but now I can say I saved $10 for the sauna tonight, and that's quite good, so it was all right. I'm used to it. <laughs> well, I guess that's part of the price of uh, hiring a big-name driver. <laughs> uh, back in victory lane again. There you see Price Cobb holding up the trophy, Drake Olson, and the old man's team. You heard him say, Drake yeah. Olson said that. I wonder how long he'll be with that team. Well, congratulations to the Dyson folks for a marvelously prepared car that didn't miss a beat all day. Just a great victory for them. Oh, an outstanding job. And the moment that they're savoring right now, it's worth all the heat, all the pain, all the sore arms from the Charlotte racetrack. You've been there eight times, and you've driven this track, and the G-forces here, they talk about, these guys are going to feel this tomorrow. Definitely will. They'll be feeling it right now. Uh, Doc Bundy brought out a, an interesting point when he started talking about his neck and how the stock car fellas do it. I really don't know because one hour in the car here and your neck is aching. But to try and put in that second one. You really don't want to go back in and have to go through that again. Here's Dave Despain. Well, let's find out who our broadcast team think was the outstanding single driver in this race, as we do on Motor Week Illustrated each week, picking the champion spark plug racer of right. the week. We want to pick the racer of the day here at the live event. And we'll begin the broadcast poll, I think, with the guy who called the action today. Ken Squire from up top side. How did it look to you? Who was the outstanding driver of this race? Well, I think attrition told the story in the prototype category of racing today. And, and it was a well-driven race for uh, Price Cobb and Drake Olson. But some of those leading contenders that would have been up there to take a shot at them, like the Klaus Ludwig car and like Al Holbert and, and like that wonderful Bayside car that has shown its merit, they weren't around. As far as I'm concerned, it was that uh, car that won in Campbell Lights today. Bob Earl is a tremendous driver, and he gave an outstanding performance here today. We saw a bit of it in our telecast, but if you're going to name a driver, I mean, he had a lot of competition around him all afternoon, and Earl would be my choice. That's a nice call. I like that, Kenley, because those Campbell Light cars uh, do put on a great show and still don't get quite as much recognition as do the big GTP machines. You shared the booth today with Bill Adam. Bill, you must have a vote for the outstanding driver here. Yeah. I am going to uh, go exactly to the same place as Ken went, and that's Bob Earl, the driver of the Fiero light car. When he had the problem at the start of the race and dropped to last, I thought, that's it. There goes your chances of victory. But outstanding. He drove with his usual brilliance, crystal clean ride, and now they've got a victory to show. Bob is my choice. Jerry Garrett and Chris Economac each had a slightly different view of the race, watching it from down at pit side. Let's go to Jerry first. Jerry, champion spark plug racer of the day nomination. Well, I'd go for Bob Earl. I know you were counting on him to, be, to go for somebody else, but uh, <laughs> at this point, I'd say Bob Earl's done a heck of a job. Like I said earlier, he's won 50% of the IMSA races he's ever been in. Well, you're still cantankerous, Jerry, but we'll record one more vote for Bob Earl. Come on, you guys, make this interesting. Economac, he always has a favorite night of the roaring road. Chris, who's it going to be? Well, I like the way Klaus Ludwig took off in that mini-engine Ford there earlier. I thought he did a, a fantastic job while he was in the running, and I sort of give him my vote uh, with all due respect to the rest of the fellows in the event. 
Well, I'm going to have to be different in that case. We've got three for Earl, one for Ludwig. I like Conch stuck through the infield when the car was loose. It was fun watching him broad slide through the corners. Crowd loved it. Yep. Crowd really ate up the Sarl Van der Merva and Doc Bundy performance in the Corvette. They were not only spectacular to watch, but they were also very much in contention to win this race. I don't usually go with a winner, but I'm going to do that. I go with Drake Olson of the two winning drivers because Olson had the presence of mind to come in when he was too hot, parked the car, screwed up the pit stop schedule, but they still won the race. Drake Olson gets my vote, but Bob Earl is the champion racer of the race. Let's go back to Jerry Garrett. Well, we're down here at Victory Circle with Bob Earl. You're our champion racer of the race. You've done another yeoman job here. Congratulations. Thanks very much. I couldn't have done it without the car and my, and my teammate Ray Bellum here. Uh, the guys did a great job. The car was flawless the whole time. We just uh, blistered a few tires. I, was, I had to run pretty hard in the beginning because we lost some time in the pits and blistered some tires, but otherwise the car was just beautiful. Well, you had a spark plug wire fall off right at the beginning. You fell all the way to last. Had to drive back up to first. Yeah, we lost. We were about 45 seconds back when I went back out again, and I, I got the okay to go as fast as I wanted to, so I had fun doing that and caught up, and then we, we tried to set our pace, and I think we got out to about a... 40-second uh, lead, I guess, when somebody else had some problems, and that's when I pitted because I couldn't see anything, and we had a tire vibration from picking up some rubber. And so I came in, gave the car to Ray, and, uh, and, and he was able to stay in front of the guys just as well as I was, and then they started falling off. And uh, I don't know what happened to them, but they started losing laps for some reason, which was fine with me, and it made it easy for him. He just had to, had to get it to the finish at that point, which he did a good job. Well, let's talk to your co-driver here, Ray. Was it a tough race for you? Uh, no, it wasn't really, because when I got handed the car, I had a good lead, and I just had to go around in 19s and 20s, and it was fairly easy on the car. Okay, well, congratulations to you on a big Camel Lights victory here today. California's Bob Earl, uh, along with Bellum, victorious in the light category, and we're going to come back to review how they finished overall as well as in the smaller prototype category of racing here today as the sun begins to come out over the Charlotte Motor Speedway. A great war, a fine contest, won today by Porsche and by Pontiac. More from the Charlotte Motor Speedway and a look at those standings as to how they finished it up after these words. Chevy Celebrity Eurosport. The only way you know it's a family car is that it's got what families value. Room, price, and at no extra cost, air available. Now there's 9.9% .9 financing available over 36 months or 10.9% over 48 months to qualified buyers of Chevy Celebrity with a 2.5 liter engine. Well, Bob Barsha is standing by at the GM Goodrich Motor Week Illustrated News Center with updates on Indianapolis. Let's go to Bob Barsha now. Thanks, Ken. With this one in the books, there are two other major stories going on in motorsports today. We'll bring you up to date. Uh, first, on the Budweiser 500, the NASCAR Winston Cup event going on up at Dover, Delaware. At this hour, about 100 laps to go. Dale Earnhardt leads, followed by Terry Labonte, Harry Gant, Bobby Allison, Jeff Bodine, and pole sitter Ricky Rudd, all on the same lap at that point up at Dover, Delaware. The other big story is at Indianapolis, where the rain has stopped. They have passenger cars on the track right now, trying to get it dried off. They hope to get qualifying back underway at Indy in about five minutes' time. That's it for this edition of the GM Goodwrench Motor Week Illustrated Racing Update. Now let's go back to Ken Squire. Victory Lane is still the focus of attention for this gigantic crowd. This is the second biggest crowd for this event. Actually, they started coming here in the early 70s. Or Constanza brought a great little Corvette in here back when I first remember it and had a wonderful race. Today, we've had exciting action all afternoon. A lot of surprises with the Ford getting in trouble early after setting a brilliant pace. Klaus Ludwig retiring. Then, the sadness of seeing Al Holbert's team fall out, which for racing fans anywhere is a sadness. That's such a fine racing team to see Derek Bell and Holbert in action is one of the joys of motorsports. Here's Jerry Garrett. Well, we're down here with one of the third place finishing drivers, Bob Lobenberg. This is your first drive in this car. You've got to be pretty happy with the result. Well, I sure am. Uh, it's been a long time since I've driven one of these cars uh, back in 82. And uh, it'll take a little bit of time to get seated back in. But for the most part, uh, everything worked out really well. Uh, of course, we'd like to be in the winner's circle. You can every time, but we finished, and that was a major accomplishment for our team. And I think Phil is delighted to, to have something to look forward to. And next weekend's Lime Rock, I hope to be there. Yeah, what have you got to look forward to with this team? Do you know at this point? Well, I, yeah, I think, I think we're going to go on for the rest of the season. And uh, I think Whitney and I make a real good team effort. 
Well, based on the results, I guess a lot of people would have to agree with you today. Bob Lobenberg. On the finish, they are now showing Vandenberger and Bundy as officially coming home in fourth. The Brassfield Morton B.F. Goodrich car in the fifth position. There was enough laps down, so he wasn't able to overtake John Morton and Brassfield, the uh, retiring, very ill Chevrolet at the end of that race. They mentioned that next week they go to Lime Rock. The International Motorsports Association has a really busy calendar. Uh, May the 26th, Lime Rock, Connecticut. Then on June the 8th, they go to Mid-Ohio, out to Lexington, near Columbus, Ohio, at Jim Truman's uh, facility. Then June 22nd, they're in West Palm Beach, Florida. And July 6th at Watkins Glen, New York, which is totally re renovated and really is becoming a, a, the old show place it used to be, we remember back in Formula One days. Mm -hmm. Then they go all the way out west, July 27th, to Portland, Oregon, with these International Motorsports Association cars. Taking a look at the standings now in the... Uh, top positions today, Drake Olson and Price Cobb win at Porsche 962, averaging some 109 miles per hour. Bob Aiken and Hans Stuck of West Germany and their Porsche 962 came in second. Then a Buick Hawk, Whitney Gans and Lobenberg finished in third position. Cyril van der Merver and Doc Bundy come home in fourth. Brassfield and Morton and the BF Goodrich car come home in fifth. In the Next position back, six and first in the Camel Light Series, it was Earl and Bellum, Bob Earl, who you met just a few moments ago, and England's Bellum with a Pontiac Piero. Rothbard and Myers took second with a Mazda, and then it was Canizaris and Katz in the Mazda, and Deborah Gregg, teaming with Colin Truman, will wind up in fourth position while the Ferrari, Fanato, Pacetti, and Barilla finally get into that car. They come home in fifth.